Welcome to the MMA Road Show, episode number 236. My name is John Morgan. Cold Coffee is with me, actually with me, here <laughs> in Melbourne, Australia. It is USC 243, Whitaker versus Adesanya. We'll get to all that in a moment, but we got to start out with what's really important. The fact that we are back at the Melbourne Central Lion Hotel. It has become tradition for us to sit in here. We have got a strong crew right now to start the night out. We've got frosty beverages everywhere, and we have none other than our man Brett Barnett to thank for it. Sir, let me just start out with a big, warm yes, road you. show round of uh, applause. Please, gentlemen. Ah, setting it up. Happy to help. Yeah. help. This is amazing, man. You, uh, you, you, you have invited us here, as you always have. You set things up for us VIP style. We're over here in the corner of this beautiful little pub here. I mean, just fortunate to be here. We got, again, a solid crew around us. And, uh, and we have you to thank for it. Return to the scene of the crime. Third time's a charm. So uh, we've got uh, <laughs> some uh, money to burn through. So let's do it. Let's do it. We, hey, we'll start working on that right away. I assure you. We've already got a couple of rounds sitting in front of us already. And I think we'll get to more very soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who should, who should, is, there, is there a person that we should be thinking when it comes to uh, thinking the Melbourne Center now? There is a gentleman by name, Bill, who uh, does look after me. Okay. Uh, we've been coming here for a few years. My uh, old or my current housemate used to work here. Okay. So I'd come here for years. I uh, wouldn't spend a dime. Yep. So I've probably racked up thousand dollars worth of free drinks. I do not doubt so that. So hence I why I come back that. because uh, <laughs> they've looked after me. Yes. Well, thank you, Bill, very much, and thank you, uh, Melbourne Central Line. We love this place, and it's it's one of those places that once you find it, because it's it's a little this it's small or whatever you call this uh, fiasco of a building. There's so much food. Melbourne and Central, I believe, is what you call Melbourne it. Melbourne Central. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's it's an amazing it's it's an amazing spot. It is kind of tucked away, but once you find it, oh. uh, this is like home, and I'm glad that that we could be back. This is like our Melbourne birth, uh, spiritual birthplace of the road show in Melbourne. This is I where we've uh, kind of taken on a lot of uh, family members, extended family members, and they've welcomed us into the Australian Well, it's become family. a tradition, so you've got to keep it alive, right? you got to keep it, it going. Even so. if you have to brave the traffic to get here. By the way. Traffic sucked today. Traffic was rough. Man. I think and normally, it was raining. I think normally we've come a little later at night, maybe. We came right during rush hour. Yeah. Uh, I'm the one that scheduled it. I'm going to take responsibility for that. That was that. a horrible mistake. That I was said a terrible 5 decision. p.m. would be a great time to get together. Terrible decision. Take out. Traffic Brutal. here is is no joke. Well, especially if, yeah. uh, if because I think what it is, they we're working on certain roads, and then and then by them working on the road, it takes out a whole major pathway out of the equation, yeah. and then everything else is backed up. Because it's not like this is not like in a lot of the major uh, cities, and say like the U.S., where it's four lanes on each side. Oh, now you're There's saying like they're inferior to us. Here they're in they're, they're kinda. But did you come from your? But not really. <laughs> did you come from your Airbnb? We came yes. originally from. You could have walked from here. From I know. There. Well, well. Ten but, minutes. But we most did say it was raining. Could. Most people could. We <laughs> were carrying gear. It yeah. Was Fair enough. Yeah. Hey, let's talk quickly about rainy. USC 243. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk quickly about USC 243. I mean, we're gonna as the show goes on, we're gonna break down the whole car. But I wanted to get the local fan perspective on it. I mean, uh, I hate using the term one fight card. I find that a little bit disrespectful. I think we're used to people it. on there. But well. That, <laughs> There you go. There you go. We're getting at it right he now. He said so it, not us. He said talk it. about because this is this is an incredible fight, and I wanted to get your take on this because uh, Robert Whitaker versus Israel Adesanya, two people with big, strong ties to the region. Of course, you know there was talk for a little while that this was going to happen in Vegas. Of course, we all yeah. remember, I'm sure, the infamous video of, of the War Room, and we saw 243 Las Vegas. And to me, that that would seem like a mistake. I mean, this fight, if ever there was a fight that needed to happen, I mean, did Ronda Rousey versus Holly Holm? need to happen here nah it was pretty cool that it yeah. happened here but this fight to me needed to happen here absolutely um and i'm happy that it is fi happening here i think the ufc wishes that max holloway could have made a quick turn and we could have had that alex volkanovsky fight here i think that would have been big that, it would have made a big difference i agree that didn't happen so knowing we got what we got as a fan what's your temperature right now because i <sighs> It's, it's fight week now. It's easy two weeks out, three weeks out, a month out to be like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But now we're here. What's 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 your temperature? Well, we're going to show out regardless. I think a lot of people would have bought their tickets when the main fight was announced. And then expecting there's going to be a big stadium card, you'd probably hope they'd stack it. But it wasn't to be the case. And, you know, they've got one, one great fight. Kind of thins out a little bit beyond that. But, uh, you know, I think it would be a good turnout. Everyone will get behind the, the local fighters, probably get behind the Kiwi fighters. Right. So, look... I, you know, I'm excited for it, but it could have been better. Tell me, is is the heat real? A lot of times everybody's like, oh, Australia, New Zealand, oh, they love fighting each other. But then it seems like they both embrace each other as brethren because they're so close. They're out here in the middle of nowhere together. So 
Is, is there is there heat between the two nations? I'll, I don't know if I'd say heat as such. It's definitely a rivalry. Um, okay. Does that go back, back to rugby? or uh, Rugby, cricket. There's been a notorious incident in the past where uh, there's a sort of illegal, or not really illegal, but a dodgy uh, underarm ball in cricket to win a test series. Oh, wow. And oh. Cricket. Yeah. Cricket heat. Cricket, cricket heat. heat. Man. So, I mean, look. I'm clueless when it comes to fucking cricket. Can I tell there's you so many ki There's so many Kiwis in Australia. <laughs> there's probably a couple of Aussies in, uh, in New Zealand, but... Look, it's a friendly rivalry. Yeah. There's nothing to uh There's no hate there or malice. Because when it comes down to it, you, it's you guys going to be rather against the ro rest of the world, right? Exactly. So we'll be cheering on Hooker. I mean, I think Alec uh, Quinn will get a, a good uh, response as well. But yeah. I think everyone will be behind Hooker. Well, I think that's going to be a great fight. Let, let, let's talk about the, the feeling of the main event. I mean, Rob Whitaker. It, it is funny to me. Rob Whitaker was, was born in New Zealand, uh, but it came to Australia very early. So, I mean, he identifies basically as Australian, of course. Yep. Uh, you know, Adesanya not born in New Zealand, but came here very early, and, and it's been alive. So of course he's the Kiwi transplant. Give me an idea of the of, of the acceptance of these two fighters in terms of because I, it, what I find interesting in market to market that that we go around the world is somehow the well that guy's too brash for us or that guy's too you know he's too reserved for us or he's too whatever. I mean, does one of those guys fit? Because they're completely different personalities, right? I mean, Rob Whitaker. Very, very respectful, quiet, reserved, intense. Meanwhile, Israel Adesanya over the top. I mean, not not crazy over the top, but willing to sell a fight and have a little fun with it. Does one or the other identify, you know, more identifiable, I guess? I think uh, people would relate more to uh, Whitaker because he's more reserved. Uh, he's very laid back. He doesn't talk himself up. He's not smack talk. So I think people respect that about him. Um, you know, Adesanya, he's a little bit... Uh, I don't know. Don't want to say. Uh, say, say it. No, I'll keep it clean. <laughs> no, I mean, look, he's quite, he's quite cocky and arrogant. Right. Um, that's not really the Australian way. We like an underdog. Uh, not to say that Whitaker's necessarily an underdog, but yeah, no, I think people just like his attitude. Uh, yeah, like a lot more. I like it too, man. I, 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 it's, it's weird. It's this weird part of the game that we're in, right? Where I mean, this is kind of quote unquote the entertainment era that people say it's about selling fights, but there's something I really like about Rob Whitaker's kind of quietness and, and humbleness and, 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 and quiet confidence, but at the same time, um, I know it's about selling fights, yeah. and I know that he's not a big star internationally. It's weird. When you when you get around him, I mean, he seems to have all the characteristics. He's a phenomenal fighter, but he's just not the guy I think that everybody's flocking to. Well, at least you see the real him. He's not trying to be something he's not. Um, you know, you see him on bed, he's having a laugh with his team and, like, taking jokes, and, you know, he seems like pretty laid back and he's going guy, but, you know, he's not going to be talking any... Uh, Crazy smack talk, so I think uh, that's a positive. I hear enough of that in the sport. Yeah, I like yeah. it. He's, he's got very subtle trash talk. I'll, I'll get into some of the subtle things he said. But let's get to uh, Israel Adesanya first. We had a chance to sit down earlier this week, a little one-on-one -on -one with uh, Israel Adesanya. And in, uh, as always, he was in good form. Yep. And uh, we'll listen to that, and then we'll bring in an old friend. Sounds or, good. Or maybe not even a friend, just an old guy. <laughs> or maybe just an old coworker. Maybe a guy I don't even care about anymore. <laughs> but first up. It's the last style bender, Israel Adesanya. Israel, it's pretty impressive. I mean, not just that you're fighting for the title, but 20 months ago, you're on the prelims, you know, making your debut there. Now, not only are you fighting for the title, stadium, you know, huge event. Give me an idea, man. Did you see this coming this quickly? Yeah. Um, that's why we took our time again to the UFC. You know, I hit Dana up in 2015. I slid in the DMs and I was like, we can do this, you know, but we took our time just to make sure we can jump in the deep end. And I think oh, someone has an interview. They can find it, pull it up. But like I, I said, you know, in 2019, I'll be fighting Rob, Rob Whitaker for the title. Incredible. Mm. You believed in yourself. I mean, your confidence was evident from day one when you mm. came in. But when did you really realize, even though, yes, you laid it out, what point along this journey did you go, oh, no, no, this is actually happening. It's getting done. Mm, probably fight number four ever. Then I realized I could be the best in the world. It was after UFC 90, and I saw Silva dismantle Cote, and I was like, hmm, I can probably be the best at this as well. And then, yeah, I just ran with it. It's been amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. Talk about the prep process for this fight, because, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a huge event, right? And you know it's all on your guys' shoulders. I mean, mm -hmm. on the one hand, you got to train as hard as ever because it's the biggest fight of your life. On the mm -hmm. other hand, I imagine you want to preserve yourself and make sure you show up for fight night. So mm -hmm. what was the plan and the balance in this particular training camp? Something I keep saying, keep that same energy. We haven't changed. All we ever do is just try and be better fighters, better, better martial artists. And that hasn't changed for this camp. All we just did was just work on ourselves to be better at fighting. And then my coaches have already studied the footage and all that kind of stuff and game plan accordingly. But 
I didn't like, oh, this is the biggest fight ever. I'm going to like do extra. I always do the extra. I always push myself so nothing's changed. We just keep that same energy. You welcomed the spotlight from the moment you got into the UFC, right? And along with that, I mean, yes, the attention is good, mm -hmm. but there, then you get doubters, you get haters, you get people that want to tear you down, right? So mm -hmm. as you're building to this journey, how do you, how do you tune those people out and, 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 and set them off to the side? Mm, I've been used to it throughout my whole career, so it's not the first time this has happened. And a lot of people who kind of just see me blow up, they're like, oh, they think they can tear me down, but they, I mean, to them it might be something big, you know, but for me it's just noise, white noise, that's it. So I've, it's just prep and ex experience. I've had experience at this and just, even in my, I'm sure people from New Zealand want to see me lose just because, you know, it's the tall puppy syndrome that's it's part of the culture sometimes, you know? So yeah, I'm just used to it and I kind of just, psh, all that. I thought it was interesting along, all along the way as well, the build up. I mean, you weren't afraid to throw some shots at Rob, you know, mm. say, hey, listen, you're not fighting, you're not staying active. I mean, you, you weren't afraid to. I'm just facts, it's all facts. I'm, I'm not lying. I've kept the same energy of what I've said about him this whole camp. He hasn't. He started off with, oh, he's not as, oh, this fella Israel's not as good as he thinks he is. And then when, I, th I think my dad was the one that pointed out that when, when, when Eugene came out and said, you know, all of Izzy's opponents just downplay his skills. They never really say how good he is. They just kind of shh to his skills. And then in this next interview, my dad pointed out that he started to like, oh, he's this, he's that. I'm mean, just keep the same energy. Do what got you to the dance. That's all I'm saying. Even the memes, oh no, I'm so offended. The memes as well, like it's, I'm just saying, do what got you to the dance, don't try and be out of character. So I'm making these guys act, act out of character. I was gonna say, was there some like mental mm -hmm. warfare type, I mean, was there a little strategy well, along the way to kind of picking at them a little bit? Nah, no strategy, I was just saying, well, I'm calling it as I see it. I've never lied, I've never said anything that wasn't true, or I didn't see as, as, as the truth. So yeah, I just say what I see, and if they wanna take whatever they wanna take out of it, and oh, he's, you know, they can try and fucking mentalist me or whatever, but nah, doesn't really, doesn't matter. The marketing materials for this event are kind of fun because he's mm -hmm. got the old belt, you've got the new belt, right? Mm -hmm. I wonder, is there, for you, is there some symbolism there in the fact that, you know, you're that, that new era, the new guy, mm -hmm. the, the next the generation? I, I, I think so. I mean, we're at Marvel Stadium. I'm a big Marvel fan. Um, yeah, I've got the new belt, the Power Ranger belt. Uh, I think even he knows, because I keep saying he, he was the interim champ. I don't know when he became the undisputed champ. Am I lying? Exactly. He is the interim champ. So when I get this belt, that's the interim belt, then I get another one, so I'll be the double interim champ. I like it. Mm -hmm. The Marvel Stadium, you mentioned it. I mean, you're, you're a showman. Mm -hmm. This stage, does mm -hmm. this mean something special? I mean, the title is what matters here at the end of the day, right? Nope. But this stage? No, uh, it's, it's, it's him, beating him right here. That's what matters, that's the goal. Like the belt, fuck the belts. They just look good every, you know, with the gold that I already have. But I mean, just beating him, uh, a, a killer like him, in his home country, that's the goal, you know? So we're storming, me, Dan, and Brad, we're storming this place to take everybody out. When you look at the matchup, and obviously you feel you're the superior fighter, but do you feel like it's something that you have as an advantage over him, or is it some deficiencies that you see in him? Why, why are you the better fighter? I'm the better fighter because you look at, you look at my last two five-round fights, and look at his last two five-round fights. Obviously, MMA math doesn't work that way, but you look at the way I am in the fifth round, even in my last fight, I showed out, you know, you look at the way he was in his last round, last round of his last fight, how he looked against a 43-year-old wrestler. Now, I don't strike like a 43-year-old wrestler. I don't, you know, pick my shots like him. If I hurt you, I'm not gonna try and bum rush you and then gas out. I'll find the shot and I'll put him away. So there's a difference in caliber of opponents that he's faced and he hasn't been active. Would you, if you were a coach, would you put a fighter into a fight after six months absence, if you were a coach, it wouldn't be something you want to do, so I wouldn't do that either. And I'm just saying, momentum's a really, really, really powerful weapon. You said the goal to beat this mm -hmm. guy in the hometown. I mean, what, what do you need to accomplish here? I mean, is it mm -hmm. just a win? Do you, do you want to have mm -hmm. another battle like you did last time where you showed everybody your heart, your will, your determination? Mm -hmm. Do you want another fight like that? Do you want to come out and shock the world with some, you know, just amazingly quick yeah. destruction? What, what exactly do you want to do? I don't want to, want to have with? another fight like that. I'm not going to have another fight like that. The only reason I figured, we figured it out the next day. Like, even that same night, we figured it out. We looked at the tape and I was like, that's what he was doing. That's how he closed the distance. Very, there was two things that Kelvin did in that fight that was really strategic and very well nice place chess moves. But for me, we've, 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 we've dusted that off. We've, we've, we've cut it off and I can see what I did wrong. So it's not going to be like last time. He th and they can look at the tape and think, oh, we can close the distance. We have to start fast because that's when he's really slow. And I, I know what they're thinking. I can see what they're thinking. But 
This is a different fight you're facing now. I've, I've been working my ass off. I've taken some time off as well. Not like him, but I've taken some time off to just like replenish my mind, my body, my soul. And now I've come another fighter. I, I've rebirthed myself, even going back to my home country and, and being inspired by what I, what I felt over there. I'm rebirthed and I just feel like I want to have fun. That's the goal this weekend. I want to have fun like I did in New York, you know, like I did against Edison Silva. Kelvin fight, he didn't let me have fun because he was beating my ass and I had to whoop his ass. But this fight, I'm going to have fun. That's, that's the ultimate goal. And when I have fun, I'm the best in the world. You saw this thing mm -hmm. coming to fruition. Now it's mm -hmm. here. So when you visualize Sunday morning, mm -hmm. how does that fight go? And where mm -hmm. does Israel Adesanya go from here? That fight goes with me. I'm just looking for me. All this is just extras. I want to get all this shit done, get the wake up done, get to the fight, get off the bus, get to my locker room. And then when I make that walk, that long walk in the stadium to the octagon, that's what I'm looking forward to. And they're stepping through those doors and they're having fun. That's the main thing. And after that, we know what's next, but I'll save that for later. I want to handle this guy first, because if I don't take care of him, then I got to start again. <laughs>
I, I'm so happy it's here, right? And I'm yeah. so happy that the USC did pull the trigger on a stadium show. I mean, don't get me wrong. Rod Laver is a, is a, is a beautiful venue, and it would have been fine. But it wouldn't have had that, you know, potentially epic feel. In fact, just before we, we sat down tonight, I saw uh, one of our colleagues, Brett Akimoto, tweeted out a, a little video. I guess they had done an interview with Rob Whitaker, and he was actually already in the venue, which is being set up. And I guess, you know, Brett Okamoto was saying that, you know, Rob just stood there, like, motionless for, like, five minutes, kind of yeah, surveying yeah. the landscape. I mean, like – Kind of visualizing what it's going to yeah. be like. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's weird because I do think that, like – from what we understand, they sold like 40,000 tickets right away, okay? And then I think a lot of people were hoping they'd get a more loaded card. It didn't necessarily happen. We don't know if they're going to break the record. They are selling tickets cheaply at the end, which I don't think is a bad thing. Get people in the door. Sell them on the idea of, of just being there. But, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to focus in on what if they don't break the record. Was this some kind of failure or whatever? But, I mean, overall, what do you feel about the USC's decision to – not have this fight in Vegas, not have it in an arena, do it in a stadium. And if they only sell, let's say, 45,000 seats instead of the 55 that they've got before, is that some kind of failure? Only 45,000. Know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, right? that's, that's a lot oh. of people to get in there to, to watch a, a prize fight. And, I, I mean, if they had done it in Vegas, they get criticized for that. People would be like, how are you going to have this fight that means the most to the people to in this, this part of the world, yeah. and you're just going to treat it like another thing yeah. that we're going to do at the T-Mobile Arena? I mean... I think this was the right move. As far as is it a one-fight card, I mean, I agree. Dan Hooker versus Ali Quinta, that's a good fight. I want to see that fight. The way you know if it's a one-fight card or not is take away that fight and ask yourself if you pay 60 bucks for it. I still pay 60 bucks for it. No, you don't. <laughs> you don't pay 60 bucks <laughs> well, for this, this fight card without this main event. I mean, if I – Oh, I, no, no. I thought you were saying if you took away the co-main, would I still pay No, yeah. 60? I mean, if you, you take away the one fight that you oh, think is the it, one fight it. on oh, the no, card. Oh, no, you're dead right then. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, no way. Yeah, and I mean, like – I got on a plane for 16 hours to come here, and if I had arrived and found out that you know another weird thing happened and this this fight got scratched, I, I would have thrown myself into the sea. Sir, I am knocking on wood currently <laughs> yes. as we speak. This Vigorously is this knocking is a on wood. wood. Yeah, we're not quite there. I mean, it looks good. Yeah. Things look good right now. It can all just happen, but last minute. But I, I mean, it is a one fight card in that sense. That this that's the one everybody is showing up for, and yet. I don't know if that's necessarily a disaster because that one fight is so good right. and so important and so compelling. At, at, at this, It feels like the right fight at the right time in the right place. I mean, the one thing I will say is if the UFC didn't do so many events, that leaves you with a little more bullets in the gun. You know, if you, if you didn't do all these other events, maybe you have a guy like Jimmy Crute hanging around to help you out here. Maybe – or, or – I mean, you heard you mention Max Holloway versus Alex Volkanovski. I mean, Max Holloway has been kind of overworked right. a little bit. Like, right. it's tough for him to make that quick turnaround. But if you don't have so many events, you have maybe a little more, uh, like a, a deeper well that you can draw upon to help you out there. Yeah, no question. All right, I want to get your takes Who's on this Israel Jimmy Adesanya. Guy you mentioned. Never heard of him? Never heard of him. Hmm. You should have. <laughs> you got to make the joke every I time. I think he yeah, pronounces right that Jimmy Crow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get your take on Israel Adesanya. We just heard from him. Um, here's an interesting thing. All right, so media day happens today, right? This was earlier today. We show up, and hilarious, right? Literally every camera, save for the MMA Junkie camera, because yep. we, veteran move, start somewhere else in the room and make your way back, and you'll get what you need. Professional. But, professional. But besides Stone all that. Stone Cold Pro. Every <laughs> single camera was, was piled up in there, and it was, it was getting tense in there, man. The local media guys, they're jockeying for position. They're pissed off about who's standing where, that sort of thing. All right, so obviously all the attention was on him. Now, th the funny thing is the way they did it today, and, and they do it a lot, is the blue corner will show up first, then they'll do the face-offs, and then the red corner will stick around and do interviews. Now, all the cameras were around Israel Adesanya. Once the face-offs happened, a lot of the cameras went back to Rob Whitaker, but not every camera, not every True. camera. They were a little more spread out. So just from that perspective, I get a feel that there's a little bit more attention around Adesanya, even though Whitaker's kind of the local guy. There was a spread in a local paper here, and it was actually featured on Adesanya. I get that. He, I, I think I get that. I mean, he's flashier. He's more quotable. Um, he's the undefeated. You know, he's got all the style. It's incredible, right? It's fun. But I will say this, and and – I hear that over at the Athletic, you have a much more uh, high pro, uh, high quality comment section than we do in some of the other places around the internet. Um, but it's a I will say this: comment section, absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I have, I have, I have seen kind of a little bit of backlash starting to build uh, on Adesanya, like th that are people 
that are kind of ready for him to lose, that are saying he's too cocky already. They're saying he's got, uh, you know, that he's just doing a little too much. So I don't. I kind of want to get your take, man. I, you're a little bit more nuanced guy than I am as to, as to where you see him on the spectrum because there's no question the guy is dripping with star quality, right? Yeah. Like he's got that X factor. I feel like he's willing to sell fights. I don't feel like he's going over the top where you're just, you know, the Colby Covington route where you're like, bro, come on, man. Yeah. Uh, you know what I mean? But yet I do feel like some resentment building around him as well. And I don't know if that's just because he's fought so frequently or because people look at him as, you know, too cocky, too arrogant. Um, I don't know. Where, where, where do you think he is in the sport right now? Well, some of the things well, you mentioned, I also noticed the thing about the, the cameras, uh, the difference in the number of cameras. Some of that might have been strategy. Some people learned during the Israel Adesanya scrum, like, hey, okay. we all can't get in here and we Fair can't play. even hear him because we're, we're crowded out so much. So we'll, but also. You think they were learning on the fly? A little bit. I like but it. But there is, he does have that quality. I, I noticed it at the open workout, too, when he comes out there. You ever see. Uh, Tom Cruise in The Color of Money, the old like uh, pool, and it was like young Tom Cruise, and you realize, like, you go back and watch it now, and you're like, oh, yeah, that's why that guy became a movie star, because you just watch him, and you're like, I don't know what this is, but I just want to watch this person, because it feels like he might do something special at right. any time. And he has that, qual even when he's just walking out on the stage, he's shadow boxing, and he's just yeah. moving around, and you're like, there's just a dynamic quality where he seems fun to watch, and you don't want to take your eyes off him. And he has that, and he also, like, when for media purposes, you're right, he is more quotable in the sense like with Rob Whitaker, the answers are going to be pretty short. They're going to be pretty to the point. And I mean, that's not necessarily a bad thing because he says what he means to say pretty quickly and it gets his point across. And with Adesanya, there's always a sense that like you don't want to miss anything he says because anything might be the, the big sound bite to come out of the thing. And he has that like that charisma, that over-the-top confidence in himself, that kind of like fighter pilot arrogance of like, I know how good I am and I'm waiting for the rest of you to figure it out. And that vision, him talking about like how he knew that this is where he's yeah. going to end and how quickly he's went from being, you know, first fight in the UFC to being ch like challenging for the middleweight title and not because it was like a manicured path to the top. He just did it. He beat the, the people he had to beat. He got here. Every, no one can deny that he's the guy who should be fighting for the middleweight title at this yep. point. And to do that all in, in such a short span of time, that's special. It's to me, and it's I feel like it's a loaded comparison to make, but it is a very Conor McGregor-esque rise. And I, and I hate to say it just because obviously Conor McGregor's tail off has been so frustrating. There's been some late. things. There's been some things that have happened. One or two little incidents yeah. here and there that are small, arguable, small but, things. Yeah, but I, small you know, things. I, uh, I don't know. I feel like the rise has been that big. I, I, I don't, uh, I don't know if you do much fight picking anymore. I know you're not a, a reluctant. Uh, I think you were always kind of a reluctant fight picker at the end of the day. I mean, I, but do you have a feel on this one? Like, is there something that, that you just have this gut instinct of how you think this thing's going? I think Adesanya can win it all at once, at kind of any time. Uh, he, his creativity and his unpredictability, his ability to, to get you uh, walking into something and to, to trick you, he can always pull that rabbit out of the hat, I think, no matter where he is in the fight. But moment to moment and skill for skill, I think Robert Whitaker is just as good as it gets right now. I, I, I mean, I think he, he just has too many things that he does too well. The big question for me is how like what kind of shape are they in physically because Robert Whitaker has been off a long time so you always wonder about ring rust you also wonder about health if he did have nagging injuries you can see how for a fight like this after he pulled out of the last one with the collapsed twisted bowel that sounds just absolutely awful oh, horrible you can imagine we've seen it before where fighters who are in the big situation especially if they've already pulled out once they feel like they can't do it again right. they, they have to show up in this one and so you do wonder you hope that he is a hundred percent and with Israel Adesanya, I mean, that fight with Kelvin Gassam, that was a tough fight, and it wasn't that long ago. And so you wonder exactly where they are as far as just, like, being able to give us everything they got. But, I mean, if they're both 100% and if Robert Whitaker doesn't get caught with something, I think he wins this fight. Robert Whitaker has been snake bit in his career, you know what I mean, and the things that he's had to deal with, some of the weirdest stuff that has happened that slowed his career down. But I'm with you, man. I mean, would it shock me to see Israel Adesanya win the fight? No, it absolutely would not. I mean, this guy is, is super talented. And to me, his rise up the ranks, as you said, it's, it's, it hasn't been hand-selected, man. He has proven things. He's answered questions. He's, he's proven that he belongs to be where he is. But Whitaker, man, to me, he looks good. Mentally, he's saying the right things. And as you said, I think he's one of the top pound-for-pound -pound fighters right now. Let, let me ask you, because I know that you like to dive into 
you know, approaches and promotional appeal and that sort of thing. Rob Whitaker is getting more comfortable with doing media. He used to just absolutely hate it. Now, I don't think he hates it as much anymore. He realizes it's part of his job. I think he feels more comfortable. He's pretty jovial for the most part. Like, he's not standoffish. He's not, again, as quotable as an Israel Adesanya. But he, there's something there. You yeah. know what I mean? It's not like he's giving you nothing. If you were tasked with promoting him to the masses, and because I feel like here, here's what I find interesting. If Israel Adesanya wins this fight, we said he's dripping with that star quality. Man, yeah. I think he blows up. If Robert Whitaker wins this fight, I'm not saying it wouldn't be big. It would be big. But I don't know if all of a sudden, you know, necessarily, like, now he's the next biggest star in the sport. So if you were tasked with promoting him or developing a promotional strategy around him, do you have an idea how you would bring him to the masses and make him somebody that, you know, casual Joe fan has to watch? Yeah, I'd say he's GSP 2.0. Mm. That, that kind of professional uh, – the, the guy who show, is going to show up in a suit and he, you're not going to have to worry about him getting a DUI, yeah. uh, that guy. And, I mean, he has a lot of that quality where, you know, GSP wasn't always super quotable either, but he right. he would tell you what he meant to say, you know. And Robert Whitaker has it where, you know, people were asking him about, uh, hey, do you think you're, you're not really responding to any of Adesanya's trash talk? Uh, do, you, do you pay attention to it? And he's like, I don't I don't pay attention to it, and I think that's what gets to him. And then, and then he'll just stop. He'll just leave you with that. He doesn't feel the need to elaborate. He said what he had to say about it. And I think that there's something to that. And especially, I think, like, as he gets more comfortable, I think on his own terms, letting people in. Like, with he, you know, he has that podcast, and he talked about dealing with depression uh, after all that stuff he went through. And I thought that was really – that's the way to go. He, he's not going to be the guy who's going to go out there and talk a bunch of trash and sell you the fight. And it would feel inauthentic if he did it. But when he lets you in and lets you learn a little bit more about who he is, and you're like, hey – Right about now, maybe the UFC could use some good guy champions, some some just like consummate professional champions who's going to show up uh, in the suit looking like he's uh, you know taking it seriously. The one thing I'll say though, he's in there in that suit. He looks sharp. Uh, all his answers are sharp. And then I notice while he's sitting there, he's got, he's got the nice dress shoes on and he's got the uh, Reebok ankle socks. No, he didn't. He had the Reebok ankle <laughs> socks on, man. I'm just like, hey, I like we're that. almost there. He but was he's staying on there. brand. He's staying on brand. We're almost where we need to be. Brother, get yourself some nice dress socks. <laughs> he was that close. He you'll, was that close. You'll feel good in them. You'll feel good about yourself. And, you know, you won't have to worry about them slipping down and the, the leather or the dress shoes cutting into that your ankle. That is the worst. I love it. I love it. All right, well, listen, uh, the Frosty Beverage is eye. Be, good eye on you. That's attention to detail, I Kenny. I that's like, what that is. I was like, who notices the socks? <laughs> that, that's <laughs> when you have attention to detail like that, you get stolen away from MMA junkie. Yeah. That's what happens, man. That's what happens. All right, well, listen, uh, the Frosty Beverage is being passed around. The appetizers are being passed around. I don't want to impact your Australia experience too I long. So, that. Ben, folks, I appreciate the time. I did have a chance to sit down and talk earlier this week with uh, Rob Whitaker one-on-one, and uh, we'll, we'll share that conversation now while Mr. Folks gets to enjoy a little bit of Australia. Rob, of course, is a champion. Every fight for you is a big fight. But this, the stadium, you know, it's huge. I mean, does it feel special to you? Does this feel any different, any bigger than your previous fights? Uh, to be honest, not really. Uh, it's one of those things where every fight, is the biggest fight for me. Every fight poses the, the biggest threat for my career, the biggest threat to my person. So it, I, I am treating it just as another fight. You know, intellectually, I can look at it and say, you know, this is, this is huge, this is my title defense, it's a milestone for me, and uh, I can't wait to get there. You know, it's gonna be a great event. But um, in, in terms of, in the fight game, it's just another fight. You know, this is being billed as the biggest combat sports event in Oceania history, and I'm not hearing a lot of objection to that. So, mm. I mean, can you soak that in at all? I mean, in the moment, <clears throat> can you sit back and go, wow, man, think about where I came from and where I am right yeah. now? I think that'll be, that'll be something I reflect on after the fact. It's, uh, I can see it being the biggest fight ever, especially for this part of the world. I'm very excited for the amount of spotlight that's going to put on not only the sport, but especially the athletes. That's very important for me because that's, that's another motivator for my career at the moment. So, um... Yeah, you know, I, I, I'm very happy with how this is unfolding. Yeah. In preparation for this fight, I mean, you know this event is built around you two guys. And you've had so many weird things, chicken pox, <laughs> emergency surgery. I mean, stuff yeah. that nobody can do anything about. Yeah. Did you prepare any differently or take any precautions or worry at all along the way? How, how did you get ready? No, you, you, can't, you can't worry about this sort of stuff. Otherwise, you know, it, it, yeah, you, you, you can't worry about this stuff. Otherwise, it, it affects you too much and mentally and everything else. I don't believe in superstition either. So um, it, it's just I just did the same thing. I just trained well. I, I, I focused more efforts on like, uh, my strength conditioning, my, my health, and, 
and really just 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 did the same thing. I trained with the same team. We got the same coaches. We worked it. We worked our asses off this camp. The camp was so long, and yeah, here I am. Adesanya's rise has been really, really fast to get to this moment. Mm. I mean, were you watching him along the way, and and, and and were you looking at him and saying, "That's inevitable. We're, we're going to have to do this at some point." Um, yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I've seen a lot of his fights. You know, I've, I've seen him fight a lot, and uh, I could always tell. Like, he's in the middleweight division, and he's winning fights. We're going to have to fight eventually, and so, so, I, and and another thing is, like, I had a gut feeling anyway. Like, there are certain fighters I look around, and I just have a gut feeling I'm going to have to end up fighting them. You know, I felt that with Gaslam, I felt that with Brunson, and I understand it too now. But uh, yeah, you know, I think it's an exciting fight. I think it's great for the region. I think it's, I think it's a great, going to be a great fight. It's going to be fireworks. Yeah, no question. It's, it is like a historical moment for the region, as you said. I mean, does it feel important? I mean, do you feel like, hey, I'm, I'm helping to carve out something? Because it feels like the sport is taking a step forward right now. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I do see that my efforts in the sport have helped the sport grow in this region. You know, and, and I can see that, and I'm very happy for it. You know, there wasn't there wasn't the sole motivator when getting into it, but it's I'm very happy that it's become a result of, and uh, yeah, because it, it was it was much harder to, to to live in this sport when when I was coming through. You know, and harder for the pioneers before me. So uh, I'm very happy that we you know we we've broken into the mainstream sporting uh, sporting spotlight, and you know we're here to stay. No question. When you look at Israel, I mean, nobody gets to where he is that, that isn't a good fighter. I mean, obviously mm. he's got skill, but when you look at his style, do you see more flash than substance, or, or do you, you know, acknowledge that no, he's got some real special skills? No, I think he has great skills. He's a phenomenal fighter. He, uh, yeah, he's got impeccable timing. He's, he uses his reach and his, his height very well. He's he's a great fighter. He really is. I, uh, but honestly, I just think I'm better. I think I'm better everywhere, and uh, you know. I'm going to try and prove that come Saturday, Sunday, for here. You're not a, a trash talker, that kind of guy, but I wonder, has he, has he gotten to you at all? Because he's been pretty open at taking shots along the way. You know, you mentioned some of the weird things that have happened to you, and he's, oh, the guy's not out there defending, he's not fighting, you yeah. know I mean? Has he, has he gotten to you at all? Has this become personal at all? Nah, not at all. Not at all. Um, if, it, <laughs> if it had become personal, I would have take, taken care of it personally. You know, it's... it's He's just selling the fight, and then he's being him, and he's running his own thing, and I'm happy for that. You know, it takes work off my plate, but um, I can't be anybody but myself. So I'm just gonna—I'm just doing the same thing I always do. I find a lot of what he says funny. You know, I get a good chuckle out of it. So, so yeah, it's, it definitely has not affected me. I look forward to, to fighting him on Sunday, just because he's a good fighter. Plus, he wants it, <laughs> and uh, yeah. You fought at UFC 193. I mean, obviously, you know, it was a different scenario then than it'll be. But I wonder, I mean, once you get in the octagon, it's the same cage, right? But did you learn anything from, like, the, the experience? I mean, is the atmosphere of that building different than other fights? Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> it feels bigger. It, like, it, it's hard to put, like, to, to explain how it exactly feels, but it feels bigger. Like, there's, it, there's just more air, like, more space. And the walkout is huge. <laughs> it's a long walk. It takes, it's like, it takes like three or four minutes just to get there. Oh, it's a huge walk. It's a huge walk. So they're going to have to run my song a couple times. <laughs> does it I mean having that lengthy walk, does it add to like nerves? I mean, I got to imagine the, the things that are going through your head in the last seconds before you get in the cage. For a moment like that, is it amplified? No, it, it is what it is. I, uh, you know, fortunately, I come out second. So <laughs> that's always good. But um, what's. Once you're there, you're behind those drapes, and then they go up, and you start walking out. It's you're there. The, 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 there's nothing. There's nothing you're really thinking about, except just just in the moment. It's hard to explain. You're not really thinking. You're kind of just doing stuff at, this, at that point. You know, I know you compete in like jujitsu and wrestling and stuff to stay sharp, even when you're not in MMA. But is the first few minutes is that is that the the concern or the key, you know, that to, to get dialed in to shake off any potential cage rush, that sort of thing? Is is that the key moment for you? Uh, not really, not really. I, uh, I'm going to do my thing. I'm good at what I do. I'm very good at what I do. So I know that when the, the door shuts, me and him touch gloves, it's like I'm just going to be doing my thing. I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to, I'm not worried about whether I'll perform. I'm not worried whether I'll do X or Y. I, I know as soon as I get in there, it's, I, I'll, I will come out. You definitely proved to the world your character in your last two fights. I mean, the battles that you went through were incredible. Mm. Are you anticipating another 
you know, epic, dig deep kind of fight like that? Or do you feel like this could be shorter, more explosive? I never have any expectations with fights. I prefer, I, I prepare for a war, you know, and I'm pleasantly surprised at anything else. So I, I am, I am prepared to go to war with this guy. I'm prepared to drag it and make it dirty, make it messy for five rounds, 25 minutes, every second of it being hard. I, I, I'm prepared for that, you know, and I'm happy to take it there if that's where, where he wants it to go. But, uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, I have 25 minutes to put him away. And I'm going to use every minute to try and do that. The goal on Sunday morning, of course, is to walk away as still a UFC champion. Mm. But outside of that, I mean, are there other goals you want to accomplish? I mean, are there messages you want to send? Are there doubters you want to prove wrong? I mean, what do you want to accomplish with this fight? Uh, mate, it's just, it's just another part of my journey. I'm gonna get out, I'm gonna get out there and I'm just gonna put on a show like I always do and always have. I'm gonna go out there and I'm just gonna be me. And whatever happens, happens. You know, win, lose or draw, I'm just gonna get back on that wagon. I'm just gonna get back into the onto the mats and just just work and prepare again. <laughs>
But I think come fight night, when this one, when these guys are both in the cage, I think actually people are going to get that little bit of goosebumps. Like, oh, this, this, I should think so. this could turn out to be a little scrap. And I, uh, it could be a hell of a way to start the main event. I think now. absolutely. And I, I actually, I'm really looking forward to it. I think both of them as well, it's quite nice that with the main event, you have that tension, right? They both, yep. th okay, uh, as much as the promotion might want to insinuate, they don't hate each other. They obviously have respect for each other yep. on a certain level, but there's a tension there. With these two dudes, it's almost uh, uh, better after, you know, uh, MMA Junkie John actually set up this fight, uh, which I assume you're getting that your 10% for. Um, they, they, they're they almost cordial. It's kind of like, they're <laughs> like, hey, listen, I, I get I get a very Donald Cerrone vibe of like, we'll go, we'll fight, beers after, yeah? That's yeah. a great way to say it, the Donald Cerrone yeah. vibe. And, and shout out, by the way, it's funny, I'd kind of forgotten about that. Dan Hooker was actually one of the, he was like, you know, it was you that set this up. And I had totally forgot. We were down in San Antonio, and he was like, I want a top 10 fighter. And I just ha I had my phone in my hand. I was like, oh, let's see who's available. I'm like, yeah. Ally Quinta. He's like, Ally Quinta it is. So it was funny. I was interviewing him and totally forgot about that. Yeah. I'm like, man, <laughs> you just made a call out, and it happens. It's that easy. He's like, well, it's not me that made the call out. Like, technically, you kind of made the and call And I believe out. they paid you up front for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I definitely got paid up front. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Talk about your interaction with those guys this week because, uh, look, Dan Hooker, I've been a huge fan of for a long time, man. We you know, had the good fortune to come down here, been at a lot of fights in New Zealand, Australia. I love the kid, man. I think he's, I think he's smart. Um, I think he's. I think he's honestly one of the brightest minds in the game. Um, I think he's a, a fantastic fighter. I think he's a, a fun fighter, man. The string of wins that he put together was impressive. Um, interestingly enough, too, uh, you know, they both kind of share that common bond, and that both of them suffered losses where they kind of came out with more respect for right, it. You know, yeah, of yeah. course, the the Edson Barbosa fight for Hooker, the Habib Nurmagomedov fight for Ally Quinta. Yeah. Meanwhile, Damn, Al that Barbosa fight. Huh? Oh, oh my too gosh. Tough for his own good. Ally Quinta, meanwhile, another guy that I think has – I mean, it's funny right now, even though he hasn't necessarily had the results as of late, I feel like his star is as high as right yeah. now as it's ever been. And he's a funny dude, man. He will talk trash to you on the Internet. He will bust your balls. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, but, he, you know, he will make you feel like you're an idiot. And then the next time he sees you, he'll be like, hey, what's, what's going on? Good to see you, man. Yep, absolutely. I, I, you, you hit it on, the, on, on the, the nail on the head, and I hadn't thought about it. But you're right. They both share – very cowboy Cerrone esque qualities, man, in, in the way they go about their career and about their fights. But talk to me about your interactions this week. Are you are you are you feeling one thing or another from either one? Well, I think the the interesting thing is you would expect Al to be on enemy territory here, right? And he just isn't. He the guy is too likable. If you're a real MMA fan, which if you have any interest in this co main event, you obviously are. You know, you're not just a, a guy being dragged in for the mainstream. Uh, you can't hate the guy. You know, you have to respect him. You, he is tough as nails, and I, I think his uh, continued openness of how much shit he loves Australia. He really likes the vibe here, and actually, yep. I, I think it does suit him. Yeah, I, I, this he had a great pop from the crowd. When yeah, he came th out th yesterday this the isn't going to be one of the cases I believe where he's going to get booed mercilessly until the fight's over. I actually think both of them are going to get a great reception, a and because of that, I don't think Al feels threatened in a sense I think yeah. he feels very comfortable here he feels pretty chill yep. I think he's very much got the just like yeah you know listen we'll show up it's lunchtime we'll have a fight it'll be great and because Dan Hooker's from this part of the world where they apparently can't really be tense, he's got the same sort of relaxed vibe as well. You know, his open workouts, he wasn't exactly nailing these combos. He's sort of just going through the motions, just enjoying it. And if you talk to him for more than five minutes, you know, the guy just feels like he's at a summer barbecue at all times. You know, yep. he's just a chill dude, happy to be here. So because of that, it's almost like a hard one to predict. So they're just both... They, they, as you are the one who made this fight, I will give you Fair. the congratulations. <laughs> Phenomenal matchmaking on my part. Well done, sir. Stylistically, well done. great fight. And personality-wise, dude, they match up very, very well. Yeah. Cold Coffee, I mean, I, I don't know how much you went back and reviewed the, your footage from the open workouts. I will say, and again, it's always interesting how much stock you want to put into yeah, an open right, workout, right? right? Yeah. Yep. But I will say, I mean, it, it does seem to me, and I, I mean, I think their careers would dictate this too, but I do feel like Ally Quinta has that – better one-shot power. I mean, I feel like he hits harder. Right. But at the same time, I feel like Dan offers a, a little bit more versatility, a, f a few more options. Yeah, I can see that. But I think, uh, and you're right, I think when it comes to different areas where you might see maybe more attacks on the ground, maybe guys wanting to take him to the ground, I think you're going to want to see Al want to keep it on the feet more. And I think he's stronger with his hands. But the thing about Al, Al, I mean, Anybody that can do what he did on a short enough notice with Khabib, right. you have to give him so much credit because you know that's like the X factor that most people don't even think about. Like To be able to do what nobody else has been able to do just shows how much toughness and how much heart 
that Al's able to muster when he's pushed against the wall. Mm -hmm. um, and with Dan, I mean, Dan is going to push him, but I don't think we're gonna, he's going to push him to that level. Dan will be, you know, he has more weapons, maybe in the sense of where you see these flashes, these bursts of creativity that maybe you don't see as much with Al because Al's just kind of straightforward in your face. I'm going to walk forward. I'm going to punch you in your face. And if you come at me, I'm going to counter, and I'm still going to punch you in your face. Whereas I think Dan has some little tricks that he might pull out of the bag. I, I will say, and again, we're talking about how much can you look in at the open workouts. And I, I was actually talking to, uh, I think it was, to uh, Rob Whitaker. I think us as journalists always look way too deep into anything. But I will say, in every episode of Embedded that Al's been in, he's been wrestling. His training's been wrestling. Yeah. Just just something I noticed. He's always wearing a head guard. I was like, yeah. Oh, what, what, yeah. Is that just a coincidence? Yeah, it, ju it just feels, I don't know. I don't, I, you just don't know, right? But you also, if you take what like Izzy said today, he's like, there's, there's levels to this game. He's like, when somebody puts something out there, they could just be putting it out there. So oh, you start absolutely. thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I love when he brought that point up. And that's true. I mean, like, Everybody knows that there's a camera in their face, and what side do they want to show? So do they want to say, oh, okay, is he working on his wrestling? Is that what, is that what he's paying attention to? But I think, I mean, when you think of Al, I mean, are you thinking he's, his, his immediate goal is going to be taking down and try to, to ground and pound? I don't see that. I just no. see him wanting to walk forward and lay hands on him. And, and that's where, if it's anything but that tomorrow, with these two guys, which both of them have proven themselves to be adept strikers. I mean, it's going to be a striking battle yeah. tomorrow. I, I think and if not, I'm going to be very upset if I <laughs> fucking jinx this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's going to be a fun fight. I mean, to, all right, to me, those top two fights, that's, you know, that th that's really the only reason I get mad when people say it's a one fight card because I think that one at least deserves some recognition. That's a fight but night headliner for sure. That's fight what I think so. So I think you, you can't yeah. hit it. Now, I do think there's some other fun fights. Let's, let's talk quickly about this main card. Sergey Spivak versus Ty Tuivasa. Now, uh, Sergey did not have a, a good... Uh, debut in the UFC. He was starched pretty quickly by Walt Harris. Um, right. I, I think I actually Walt gave Harris him. Walt Harris is fighting on a whole other fucking Walt Harris level is on a different right level now. right now. But I, I think I get I, in my rookie report series. I think I gave him an F. Uh, so yeah, not, not good. Yeah, yeah. So I apologize. He's nine and one. I mean, luckily he doesn't speak English, so he probably there's no way he ever read it. Or emphatically, saw. doesn't speak English. Absolutely. <laughs> What's crazy? Awesome, meanwhile, I, and, and, and again, I don't want to say this is a setup fight. I mean, I. I, but I mean, <laughs> I, mean look, I hate to say it. I mean, look, heavyweight division, anything can happen. Yep. I do think, I mean, listen, Ty's in need of a big win right now. I mean, like, yep. he had a couple setbacks, and he had a phenomenal attitude about it today. I mean, talking to him, I mean, he, he, he was saying, I heard him say it over and over. You know, he's like, I've won many and I've lost a few. It yeah. just happened to be these last two, you know. Yeah. Uh, but, he, but yeah, I mean, Ty always has a great attitude about everything. I do feel like, again, I, I, not a setup fight, but I, I do think the, the, the UFC would like to see Ty get a win, especially here in Melbourne. This is a nice fight, and again, it could lead into what could be, a, 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 you know, give us a little momentum going in. Right. But I, I got to ask you, Oscar. I know that. I mean, we had a great. Everybody has a great interview yeah, yeah. with Ty. He is just one of the funniest dudes in the game. Absolutely. Yeah. I did. I did talk to him a little bit. I, I tried to get a little bit deep with him today, as deep as you can get with Ty Tuivasa. I don't right. mean that as an insult. I just mean because he likes to have fun. Yeah. But I did ask him. I was like, Hey, you know, something that's really cool about yourself. And I assumed he knew this. It seemed like he didn't. You were there. I don't. Know. I said. Listen, you know, you are kind of forever etched in history right now. Like, as far as the big, famous UFC opening video, the Bob O'Reilly, like, you're in it right now, but it's you drinking the shoey. I'm like, <laughs> are you okay with your career if it ends? Like, you're just the shoey guy? Yeah. Or, you know, do you want to, like, have some moments, like, maybe they take the shoey out and they show you, like, you know, obliterating a yeah. couple of people <laughs> on the way or whatever, you know, have a little bit more big accomplishments. And it was funny. It kind of – Again, you wouldn't expect him to get too terribly deep with it or whatever, but he had fun with it. He was like, hey, listen, I'm here. I, you know, I'm, I'm still young. I've accomplished great things. But, I, you know, I, I think he realizes that there's still potential. He's young. But I wanted to ask you about your – because you, you had a great interview with him. And, and I don't even know if, 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 if the part we need to talk about is fighting or the fact that you just – you, you, it's kind of your thing now, right? You're having, yeah, you're having people a couple of people now. going through your, your Tinder. Is it yeah, I just, you know, listen, I'm not very lucky in love, and, and Ty seems to be quick with his words, so I just handed the phone over to the better man, and I asked him to go through my Tinder and maybe send a couple of messages for me, and he did that enthusiastically, might I say. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's been cut out of that video because, of you know, Ty is uh, an explicit man, and yes, he's got he explicit tastes. So, you know, you just kind of have to deal with that. But listen... Like you say, man, Ty is a really interesting dude. And, and 
I, I won't even talk about my own interview as much as I talk about uh, ESPN's Brad Okamoto. He interviewed him right before me, and he mentioned that Ty had had a personal loss in his life. Someone had, had passed away, and I could see Ty was hurt by that, you know. And I think Ty might be one of those guys who actually is a lot deeper than we realize, and he covers it up with Absolutely. the clowniness yep. and, and stuff like that. And you know, it's it's a weird one, right? Because we're talking about his, his fight with Sergey. I think it would be great for Ty to get a really emphatic win here. I think he has the potential to be... It, it's kind of a weird comparison, right? And it's a lazy comparison. But he could, to me, be the next Mark Hunt. Fan favorite. Now, listen, he might not win a world title. Fine. But he has a place in this sport. He has a place on this roster. And I'd like to see him live up to that potential. And... It, um, not to be too explicit to us, the listener, as he said to Brett Okamoto, is like, so far, the only people who beat me are old cunts. He's like, this guy's not that old. Wait, wait, wait. That's okay to say down here, by the way. Hey, listen, yep. by the way, yeah. it's true. Yeah. It's true. So, Cold coffee takes advantage of it as much as possible. <laughs> I, I, know, but I, I did think he was distasteful to say to the waitress that she was a cunt. I don't know why he said that. I don't know why he said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, listener. But yeah, I, I, I think, uh, you know, like you say, you don't want to call it a setup fight, but the chips are there for him to get back on the horse and, and, and to show let's get away from this clowniness let's get away from the shivy let's get back to like how good are you as a fighter can you beat this lower level guy or can't you that's a great way to say it it's not a setup fight but it's a truth fight you know yeah. what I mean like look hey it's set up here on the table if you're the guy yeah. show us you're the guy if you're not then we're going to have to reassess yeah, yeah, where you stand yeah. we're gonna have to let's get less like your personality is beloved because you got to back it up now I agree. All right, let's talk about Luke Jumo versus Diego Lima. Probably, if I'm being honest, the, the one main card fight that's probably getting the least attention. Although, the other main card fight that we'll get to in a minute wasn't getting attention. I think we're just all <laughs> excited about it now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, two very, very just cool guys. I spoke to Diego uh, Lima. They, the, the, both of the Lima brothers yeah. there are phenomenal. But Diego is just serious. I mean, we, we and that is the funniest thing about the sport because we always talk about, oh, that guy's so nice. That guy's so nice. I mean, yeah. there are literally so many nice human beings. But he is one of the most over-the-top, yeah. just happy-go-lucky. I think lucky. he said positivity to me 300 times today. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And, you know, it's so funny. I was talking to him. You know, he went through a couple losses. He's put together some wins now in a row. And I'm like, you know, talk to me about, you know, the difference. He's like, ah, it's just, you know, it's what the Lord wanted, you know. I'm like, okay, cool. But, you know, other than divine intervention, uh, <laughs> what else, you know? He's like, no, no, that's it. He's like, it's just God. Like, there's nothing. I can't I can't point to anything training. I can't. I'm like, dude, you. It's big JC up there. I'm big JC. In the shots. He had. I'm like, I love he it. Loves dude. knockouts. I love it, man. Yeah, Jesus does love knockouts. We know that. Uh, but I just love his just again his positivity, his happiness, yeah. man. It's 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 infectious. Luke Jumo. I know that you kind of uh, weren't expecting to talk to him, but the, the way the schedule worked out, you were able to slip him in a little bit. Yeah. And I, I, I know. I don't think you'd ever talked to him before, but you kind of walked away a little bit impressed by him. Oh, absolutely, massively. Because again, and we just mentioned it about Dan Hooker. Like these guys down here, you know, we're we're not from these parts, but these guys down here, they just have an innate coolness, an innate right. relaxedness, and it's very very easy to talk to him. So I didn't know the guy from Adam. You know, I've never spoken to him before in the, in, in the business, and. Uh, we just clicked and one thing I found very cool about him was I was saying you know like Diego Lima is possibly the smiliest man on the planet um, so smiley I was like does that does it's that infectious that, smiley yeah, I was like does that affect you at all you know we, we get these trash talkers does any of it affect you or do we the media just sort of push that on you like oh you know he's looking a bit tense and he uh, he said actually do you know the f only time he's ever been affected by something out of the cage was is the first time he did weigh-ins it was a small thing and the guy brought his kids and he said, oh, man, when I saw those kids, I didn't That's even tough. want to punch him. He was, like, I felt bad. he was like, you know, yeah, sure, he got knocked out, but I felt bad. <laughs> and we, we were laughing. I said, oh, man, you know, now everyone hears this interview. They're going to bring their fucking extended families and nieces and nephews and all sorts. He went, oh, hey, listen. Introduce him beforehand. Did, yeah. I, did you meet my kid here? This did is little Johnny. Kid? This is Johnny, too. And he, but he really he's idolizes got, me. He's got a disease. It's not super serious. <laughs> it's, it's rare. It's difficult to treat, but it's not super serious. Just don't breathe too heavily near him. Don't breathe too heavily near him. He really is crappy. Thing. But he did, he did say, I said, oh, they're going to, and he laughed. He went, oh, but listen, he still got fucking knocked out. So I respect <laughs> that. But he, he just had that cool sort of vibe. And I actually, like, you know, guys, I, I to be, it's very easy to sort of just gloss over prelim guys. And I know I even I'm guilty of doing it sometimes in this profession. But I really recommend just keeping an eye on that guy. He's a cool dude. And I think he, uh, you just like characters in this game. Yes. No, no matter what scale. No one really likes to come out and say it, but sometimes the dude who comes out and goes, I'll fight who they put in front of me. Training camp's going well. Wake up's great. Listen, sometimes they're great fighters. They might not be the most interesting people to listen to. I would say that this Luke, 
is an interesting dude to listen to. I'd, I'd look out for him. I do. I go. agree, and I, and I think it's going to be a banger. I, I do again. A banger. Wow. Is that, is that racist <laughs> from another person? No, no, no. Uh, not racist. No, no, no. <laughs> ah, I just sounded like one of them. Bang <laughs> Them? What do you mean, <laughs> them? Australian. <laughs> oh, okay. Ah. No, I, I tell you. I I'm didn't say, like, use people. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, we can never come A back banger. here again. We're never going to be allowed back. What? <laughs> no, listen, uh, I, I do think the, schedule, the, 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 the roster they put together for this main card is going to be solid. It's going to be entertaining. Again, I, I I totally get it. We're talking about the quality. Is it deep? Is it whatever? Now, nah, is it is it is it 245, which has three title fights at the top? No, but I, I do think there's going to be some real entertainment but, but value. But now, listen, dude. Like, listen, we've seen it time and time again. Like UFC 200 was that a barn burner every fi fight? No, nope. I don't think it was. And then we had to UFC 206 where it was like Holloway versus Pettis, and there was like no one else really on that. Every fight was a barn yep. burner. Yeah, do you have choice stuff? So. You can't judge it till you watch it. That's I sound it. like Dana, but you well, can't no, judge well, it. Well, no, that's the thing is I hate saying it because it, it sounds like it's cliched, but as we're really talking about these, I'm not just saying, like, hey, you never know. I'm telling you, the people, the matchups yeah. we're looking at, yeah. I, I think it's good. And that brings me to the final main card fight, which this one is the one that I think has stolen all of our hearts this <laughs> week, right? I mean, this only got promoted to the main card, of course, because we lost Holly Holm. Holly Holm was supposed to fight Raquel Pennington. Late injury to Holly Holm. Uh, unfortunately, it's off the card. Uh, again, I don't think that was another one of those fights that was like selling a ton of tickets, but it was a meaningful matchup in yeah. the division. You know, it would have been a good fun watch. It would have been a good one. Uh, Holly Holm is, is definitely a star. There's no yeah. question about yeah, it. She, yeah. she drives clicks. But we end up getting this heavyweight matchup between Jorgen DeCastro and Justin Toffer promoted to the main card. 5-0 and Jorgen DeCastro versus 3-0 and Justin Taffa, and they are fighting – on a pay-per-view <laughs> in a stadium in front of, you know, potentially 50,000 people. Yeah. And I think we're all like, what the hell? What are we – we? now, here's the thing is, uh, I – we knew Jorgen DeCastro, right, because we had all seen him on the Contender Series, and Jorgen was a good dude, right? Like, Jorgen came in, he was a big underdog, he has this big win, and then he comes back and talks to us, and he's infectious, right, man? He's just talking about, yeah. man, oh, listen – Man, this is great, how amazing it was, and he's laughing, and he's smiling. And you're like, man, this dude is awesome. And his fighting style is fun, right? I mean, yep. it's great. So, listen, I did my picks, and I heard about Justin Taffa. I'll be honest. I had, seen, I had seen the results. I hadn't seen the footage. I'd only seen the results, and I was like, okay, chopping up dudes on the Australian yeah. regional scene. All right. I, you know, cool. But I've seen Jorgen DeCastro in person. Uh, I picked Jorgen DeCastro. I have since changed my pick to Justin Taffa. Now, you did. I did change, change my pick it? to Justin Taffa. Now, I, I, I did it partly based because I have seen the footage now, uh, and, and the <laughs> dude has been tearing people. Like he's been he's been he's been knocking people dead, dude. It's been <laughs> it's been crazy. But the other thing is, I just think this dude is even more infectious than Jorgen De Castro. Dude. This guy has an amazing personality. Oscar, I know you know you kind of were there and saw. I mean. This guy, and, and, and you, I think you nailed a lot of his traits, his personality. You know, I was doing an interview, but you were there and kind of hanging out and working and doing some other things too, and, and you were able to observe it and see it. Yeah. And I think you, you, you kind of nailed some of the observations better than I did. Yeah, so I was, I was watching, uh, like a voyeur, I was watching John <laughs> do his interview with him. And, you know, it's, it's very is, Oscar. Yeah, yeah just see, <laughs> the curtains are wonderful from the outside, by the way. But listen, <laughs> no, they, you sort of watch these interviews, and, and again, we're talking about sort of lower-level guys, you know, three fights and stuff like that. But certain people just catch your eye, and he was talking big fucking Samoan dude, you know, has that Mark Hunt vibe about him. And again, he's just chilled, but he's like, oh, yeah, just going to smash some cunt. And yeah. he's like, oh, dude, this guy <laughs> is off the out. chain. And he has a very interesting sporting past. You know, he was involved in other sports, and he yep. became a fighter. And from our good friends at Submission Radio, apparently he has been literally murdering people in the right. cage, just yep. knocking people dead. And... I don't know if I can put my finger on it other than he has the very he's a definitely a protege of Mark Hunt but I just definitely had that experience that he has that X factor and I really believe that if you watch John Morgan's interview with him which I highly recommend you do and he gets a big knockout here I think there's a guy here there's there's something here I don't know if you'd agree John I agree I agree no that's why I changed my pick I'll be honest with you I'm he also looks as tough as well. Oh, my God, dude. It's crazy. <laughs> I, I love it. He's just like, you know, I thought I'd be in the UFC like maybe next year. But, you know, I'm sitting on the beach drinking some beer. They called me up. And I said, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. Put me in. So, yeah, no, listen. I, I, I do. It's funny. It's easier for me to make actual fight picks 
to people I haven't talked to because I have no emotional connection right. to them whatsoever. I can just make a fight pick. Uh, but I, now I've got an emotional connection to Justin Toffin, man. I like I like this guy. I like hey, this guy. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do. Uh, we've got some more friends showing up. The party keeps growing. Mm -hmm. The food's being delivered. The beer is being you distributed. This bit was I'm, seeing these, I'm seeing these chicken parmas. <laughs> oh, the and chicken I literally, parma. My mouth well, started drooling. I don't even think you – well, you, should, you see, we, we, we tipped our hands there. I don't think you call it the chicken parma. It's just the parma. Is that what it is? It's just the parma. You don't call it chicken parma. All right. So you messed up. Maybe it is. It's the parma. You're not quite as local. It's yeah, a parma. You, you, I'm not get a parma. local at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to get those legs tattooed, and you're yeah, going to be let's fine. let's do it. You can oh, pass. Wow. It's a real banger. <laughs> all right. Well, listen, we're we're going to get reset. Uh, I, I do. I, you know, Go check out the video if you can, but if not, uh, we'll at least bring you the audio so you can hear this interview. Uh, you might not get all the, 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 the facial recognition and all the uh, expressions that, that you might get from seeing the wonderfully shot video by Cold Coffee oh. that is featured on yes. MMA. It's, like, what, it's like watching YouTube. Picasso paint. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> the video <laughs> images that the man makes. Mm. But if not, at the very least, you can hear from uh, a guy that I'm excited about, Justin Taffa. This is uh, this could be a banger. <laughs> <laughs> You're both fired. <laughs> Justin, 3-0 in your career, and you're about to make your UFC debut. I mean, did you ever in a million years see you know this quick path to the UFC? Bro, no way. You know, like, to be honest, I had, like, a couple of years. I was thinking maybe at the end of next year, that was, like, my goal. But, man, they just came knocking after my last fight. And I was like, damn, I'll take it, bro, 100%. Well, say, what's the conversation like? I mean, when they come, I, I, I can see the argument, hey, let's take a little time. Let's get a yeah, little yeah. bit more experience. But at the same time, yeah. when they come calling, they come calling, right? Yeah. So what, what was the, the, the conversation like? The thing was, like, um... I finished my fight and then I went and took my way out, like my partner and my son's Bali. And then I get a phone call, you know, someone's like, hey, I think the UFC are interested in you. And I was like, what the heck? Not once did I ever like plead, you know, because a lot of people are like, right now, they, they get to social media and they like put their last name for UFC hashtag or whatnot. But for me, I think they came, at, came like looking for me and stuff, man. I was just like, sweet. They wanted me on the contenders originally. And then ended up bump, bumping me onto the card, man. So I was just like, oh, oh, man, I'll take it. So then not only are you making your UFC debut, but you're doing it in front of potentially, you know, 60,000 people in this yeah, stadium. Bro. What's what's that feeling like? Man, I, I've been blessed to, to walk out Mark, Mark Hunt. You know, and, and I remember before one of his cards, I saw Izzy, you know, like I saw Israel. And he was like, hey, man, when you take that walk, pretend it's yourself because in the future, you're gonna, it's only time. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. So when Mark walked out, and you know the reception he gets, I, 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 I took it as if it was my own, man. So once I got to the cage, I was like, man, I can do this. After that, I was like, bro, I'm definitely doing this, you know? Like, I can do this walk. That's and I, awesome. I can do the walk off too. So. <laughs> Mark Hunt, he's uh, been a little bit of a mentor for you in the earlier days? Yeah, 100%, you know? Like, he built, built a team like four, four or five years ago. And me and my younger brother were like real, real blessed to, to come on board. And then Ty was on board. And then, Tyson was there later on, and you know, like the team that he's built. I, I think myself, Ty, Tyson, my little brother fights in Glory. You know, he's like a top five heavyweight in the world. So man, he's he's done well, man. Like a lot of props go to him, man. What's the biggest lessons you take from our economy? Is it is it physical, uh, tactic, your, skill, or is it mental? Keep your guard up. Nah. <laughs> um, mentally, yeah, it's 100% the mental game. That guy, man, he's got no hesitation, man. Like you talk to him, and he. You know, might have a bad training session, and then he'd be like, "I'm still knocking that guy out." You know, and I was like, "Damn!" Well, he, he like, no matter what he'll go through, he's adamant. And I was like, "Damn, I need to have that same mentality," and it's really helped me, man. You know, it's interesting because you're new to the fight game, right? But you're not new to being an athlete, and you're kind of one of this new breed of these rugby. It seems like more and more rugby stars yeah, are making yeah. it into the fight game. So, yeah. what is it about rugby that kind of leads you to being at least a little bit prepared to fight? Well, like. I love playing footy, you know, like like rugby, but um, fighting's been in my family, you know, like my grandfather was like a national light heavyweight boxing champion, and my uncles were world kickboxing champions. One of them fought Mark in K1, so it's it's just in the blood, bro. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You've taken your training camp out to Thailand. It seems like Tiger Muay Thai out yeah, there yeah, is, yeah. is is really becoming a, a, a super camp of yeah, sorts. Bro. What's what's it like out there now? Man, it's awesome. You know, I get to work with Frank and uh, George Hickman, the Hickman bros, and also Glenn, he's going to be cornering me. Like, it's just a good atmosphere. Everyone's just trying to get better, get all different looks from around the world, man. It's just like, you can't explain it unless you get it yourself and you see the environment that's there and the energy that everyone brings, man. Everyone's just trying to, trying to get better, man. It only helps yourself. 
Yeah. Talk about the matchup. You know, as you said, you were thinking about going on the contenders. That was kind of the plan. You saw Jorgen come through the contenders. I mean, he's still relatively new in his career, too. Yeah. So what, what do you think about him overall as an opponent? Man, he's all right. You know, like, he's got a good good kick to him. I think it'll be, it'll be a fun fight, man. Like, if he wants to bang, I'm like, I'm ready to bang. You know, like, I've spotted guys like Mark and Bam Bam and, uh, and Tyson and all that, so... And I'm Samoan, bro, so it's in our blood to rumble, man. If you've seen Sifu and Hunt, it's in our blood, so... Either way, bro, like, I know he, want, he, he wants to win, but it's not going to be happening, bro. It's going to be the first time a lot of people see you fight, obviously. Yeah. I mean, looking at your record, 3-0, 3 KOs, I think people could probably infer that you're somebody that's going to bring some excitement, that's going to come looking to finish yeah. the fight. But if they haven't seen you, what, what type of fighter are you? Yeah, like a, I don't know, man. Like, I'll just say I'm a striker. I want to knock guys out. You know, that, that at the end of the day, I just want to knock this guy out. I just want to see him go stiff. You know, like walk off. That's that's all I want to do. What overall is is your goal in this fight? I mean, obviously, of course, it's to win. Yeah. But I mean, is this something where like you want to come and explode on the stage and show yeah. like I'm this new contender, or is this more like? Hey, let me let me get in there. Let me prove I belong at this level. Let me yeah. prove to myself. I mean, when you think about this, other than just winning, I yeah. mean, what's the goal here? Well, for me, it's it's. I want a good impression, you know. I want people to see that I'm not just your typical banger. Like I do have a, a all around the game. I do have a good cardio tank. So it's going to be like, damn, this someone's got some cardio. You know, they're like, oh shit, this guy's got some cardio. Might call me Justin Covington or something. Nah, <laughs> something like that, man. Like you're gonna see all around the game. You're gonna see some good, some good volume, bro. Some good power. It's just gonna be like, damn, this guy deserves. This guy deserves to be here, and this is why he's on the main card now. I was gonna say, I mean, so you've you've imagined this moment. Now it's on the main card. I mean, I can't imagine a bigger debut than this <laughs> pay-per-view main card stadium yeah. show. I know you're planning on getting your hand raised. What do you think? Are we gonna see, you know, as you said, a tactical affair, a good battle back and forth, or do you feel like you can go out and dominate and get your hand yeah. raised quick? What what do we see? Well, to, like, to be honest, like, I don't know, you know, like, I don't chase the knockout because that's when you start, you know, throwing your game plan out the window. I want to be like a, I don't know, it's like a cerebral assassin, bro. I'm just going to, I'm going to break this guy down and then he's going to give me his chin and then he's going to go to sleep. That was Justin Top. I'm telling you, the man, uh, he, he captured my heart, Cold Coffee. I'm just going to be honest, man. I, I like his spirit, yeah. and uh, I like his story. It is funny, by the way. We found out he is uh, a client of a good friend of ours, Daniel Rubenstein, yes. who uh, reached out to, uh, to yes. kind of uh, laugh a little bit and say, hey, uh, I know Justin thinks it was that <laughs> easy to get to the UFC. He's like, but it a, wasn't that a easy. A little more happened behind the scenes. I had to do a little bit of work to get him in. Well, especially when you look at the camp that he comes from, I mean uh, – Mark Hunt and all those guys. I mean, like, what a great camp. And the way that he carries themselves, I mean, they should they should be proud because they, they brought another one up along the same lines as those guys. I mean, those guys carry themselves well. They put on good fights. And they just – they're the kind of guys that you – I just – you want to hang out with. Like, yep. you know, if I was here and, and, and we were watching a rug, rugby game or something, you know, they, they, they seem like they'd be a good bunch of dudes to throw back some beers and maybe, you know – Eat some wings and, and, yep. and watch some rugby, you know. So No question about it. I'm excited. All right, well, listen, want to make a quick little amount announcement. We've uh, Fortunately, this is a good week. We've had a chance to spend some time together, actually yep. be together on the road, which you don't true. get to do all the time. It's true. And we've got to have a, a, a great opportunity like this, which is phenomenal, man, for all of us to be hanging out tonight, which right. uh, we enjoy doing. And it's kind, of, it's kind of got me thinking this week, man. It's got me thinking. I, I want to get back to the return, basically, of Patreon.com. Patreon.com slash the MMA Roadshow. It's an initiative that we wanted to launch a little bit. Um, and then, truth be told, we kind of came upon some tumultuous times in the MMA junkie history, we'll say. Yeah. It Changes. Made it difficult. Kind of throw things around. It's been a while. Yeah. But I want to get back to it. And, I, and I'll tell you what this. Um, I, I, it was a community that we were starting to grow so that we could have events like this, like right. we're having right now. And, and I want to get back to doing it um, because, listen – this is something that you and I invest a lot of time in, and right. it does cost us a little bit of money, and that's cool. We love it, man. I right. love providing free content. I never want to charge people for content. Right. But we do appreciate the little bit of financial support because I will tell you this, my wife doesn't appreciate me 
spending money on things. Uh, she wants us to, to, to maybe be able yeah. to offset our costs a little bit, and we want to be able to do more cool stuff like this. Maybe yeah. we get on the road a little bit more. That, that we can do it ourselves. That would be good because I know people ask, like, they're like, uh, does the does the support help? And it does. It because, helps tremendously. You know, every every few years, just to throw you a couple of numbers, every few years, just even doing the hosting costs us about six hundred bucks yep. for every three years. You guys help make that happen. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, keeping the domain name. You know. The, st the data storage, all that stuff all starts to add up. The recording and, equipment that it takes just to yeah, do it. Yeah, and you all are helping making that happen. So, um, yes, every little bit helps and every little bit matters. And, you know, we've been really trying to just try to think of ways to start giving back and doing more. And, uh, you know, and John made a good point about it. You know, like so often so many people out there are like, oh, I got to get on Twitter so I can interact with people. I have to get on my Instagram and do all that. And all that shit's great and all, you know, and, of course, we'll be – on that and doing stuff but especially for you that have that have taken the time to really jump on the patreon use that as your chance if you if you want a question you want something asked you know if you have a question or something go there yep hit us up there and we we're going to be better about doing that and i know john's going to talk more about that but i mean we need to step it up and and and, and to find ways to to do things better to help with you guys no question about it for those for those that stuck around even though we kind of tailed off a little bit man i owe them the utmost respect the utmost thank you but yeah, yeah I, I want to develop this little community a little bit you, you talked about social media twitter instagram all that stuff is cool but then you end up dealing with all the idiots and the knuckleheads yeah. out there and, and i like moments like this where we just have a cool ass community around us and i want to help yeah. develop a cool little community i will make sure that you like listen if, if you're a part of us of our Patreon community, trust yep. me, you will have direct access to me. I'm going to log into this bad boy. I'm going to answer questions. I'm, you got questions you want to ask for a fighter? Hit me up. I'll ask yeah. it for you. Now, granted, if they're ridiculously rude and annoying questions, I am not going to ask gonna those ask questions. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Things that maybe you want to answer that I hadn't thought about, you know what, man? I'll do yeah. it. I'll, I'll make sure that, that gets done for you. And I'll be honest, social media bugs the hell out of me sometimes, but I love talking fights. There's nothing I would rather do than get together and talk about fights and talk about fights with real fans. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like, uh, you know, I, I try to get on Twitter, I try to get on Instagram, whatever, and we end up uh, overlooking the real fans because of all the yeah. BS that's on there. Yeah. So I, I want to kind of see if we can build a little roadshow community, man. I think I that agree. would be a lot of fun. and. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I want to enjoy that a, a little bit yeah. more. I think that would be cool to, to know who the real supporters are, who the, the people that, that really are into this and, and, and want to be a part of it, man. I, yeah. I, I would love to do something more like that. So yeah. I'm just saying we want to relaunch that initiative, and I appreciate everybody that's been patient with us and understanding with us, man. The people that have stuck around, trust me, I'll be reaching out to you personally because you are phenomenal. Um, but I'd like to do it again. So I'm going to ask everybody, if you haven't logged into iTunes, you can still go do that, but maybe – Log into Patreon.com instead. Go to Patreon.com, the MMA Roadshow, and uh, sign up. Give us yeah. a little support. We're not asking for much. We can do this for as little as $3 a month. $3 yeah. a month is nothing, but it, it, it means a lot to us. Yeah, and I mean, if you guys have suggestions, things that you want to know about John, you want to know about me, you want to know about certain fighters, if there's other stuff that just doesn't fit the norm of what stuff that we might curate throughout the week i mean give us ideas tell us what you want tell us what you're looking for like you said if you have questions if you want to know whatever if you want to know that uh you know i was voted best dancer in high school i can i can tell you that don't give but, away all the goods right oh, now that's true that's true that's true I can't, I can't tell you what else i was voted best something else but i won't tell you I'm going to keep that for the Patreon. Unless you saw Patreon.com <laughs> and you reach out to us there, you'll have direct access to us there. And, uh, yeah, listen, it, it, we're not trying to get rich. Yeah. But it would be fun, man. I, yeah. I, I would love to do it. And I would love to see what else we could come up with yeah. and what else we we'll create. I so, agree. Uh, and even if you don't, we love you for listening. But, you either know, way. just either way. <laughs> either way. All right, listen, uh, I want to do get to the other half of this uh, main card opener because, as I said, Justin Taffa, he stole my heart this week. But Jorgen DeCastro stole my heart at the Contender Series, and yeah. I don't think we can just overlook him. This dude has a great attitude as well. He was fun. Uh, he was he was having uh, some some enjoyable moments with us laughing and cracking up. Yes. Some things uh, behind the scenes that maybe we can't say, but we can say on Patreon.com. Anyway, uh, <laughs> listen, we'll, we'll get to that. It is, this is uh, my conversation earlier this week with Jorgen DeCastro. Jorgen, four months ago, you're fighting to get into the UFC. You're not even a part of the roster. Now you're going to make your debut in this massive stadium show. Get, just give me an idea what the, the feeling is like, the excitement level, the nerves. I mean, what are the emotions right yeah, now? I mean, I mean, I just feel like blessed, man. I feel like so grateful for everything. And it, this is the perfect, perfect timeline and, and perfect card for me to do my UFC debut. 
when you heard what the idea was for you to be in the stadium show, I mean, were instantly did you did you say yeah or was it a little maybe nerve wracking, a little scary? Oh, I, oh, I definitely got never freaking out. Say, wow, I used to fight for three hundred people in in Twin River Casino. My last one was fifty people in Vegas. Now I'm going to be walking in sixty thousand crazy fans of Australia, screaming for against me because I'm fighting a hometown guy. So that was crazy. But I say, I mean. This is UFC. This is what we sign up for. So I'm looking for it. We hear about octagon jitters all the time. I mean, I know you won't know, I guess, until Sunday morning exactly what it feels like. But what about now? I mean, are there, are there nerves? I mean, you're, you're kind of getting into UFC fight week for the first time. No, I was chill. I was relaxed. But then I got a, I stopped in China last, uh, yesterday. Then I, got a, I opened my phone. They said that my fight got bombed from prelims to main card. I freaking out. I get start to sweat. I say, well, I mean, I already had a lot of pressure. Come in here to fight. Now I'm gonna fight in the main card. This is crazy. I mean, a lot of pressure right now. But I'm I'm, I'm gonna wear it now and and I'll, I'm gonna let it go when when the time comes. That's awesome. I know you haven't uh, cashed the UFC paycheck yet, but you know when people make that jump to the UFC, a lot of times we hear about training changes, focus changes, goals change. How has life changed for you since you won your way on into the UFC? Money wise is still the same. I mean, I'm broken. Right? <laughs> I'm still working. I work. I work. I work 5:30 to 3 every day. Uh, we we the schedule training remain the same. We do strength and condition four times a, a week. Then then the rest is jujitsu and and kickboxing. And we sparring twice a week. And financially, we're still broke, but we you're gonna get better. <laughs> Does it feel like the, the, you're finding a new gear? Like it, this is like a new ch it, chapter? It, I can't wait. I can't wait to get my check on Monday. <laughs> Cool. No question. I know you haven't made your debut yet, but I gotta ask. I mean, just being in the UFC, are you the most famous athlete from Cape Verde? I uh, will say so. What do you think, Ferlin? What do you think? Uh, soccer. The UFC fairly new there, but he's one of the biggest unknown. <laughs> biggest. I, I would say but, yes. Yeah. Biggest. He's probably one of the biggest. Is that cool to you? I mean, is that something special? That's yeah, cool. I'm, I'm all over the place. Even like in my little town for River. I can go to a gas station on all month and everybody know me and, and take a picture of me. Like I'm driving, people stop by me and beat me. Go get it, go get it. So I say, wow, it's pretty excited. I oh. guess it's, it's a big deal. No doubt. That's all. all right, talk about this matchup that you got. Justin Taffa, a little bit of an unknown as well, right? I mean, he's only got three fights as a professional, making his debut. What do you know about the guy? What do you think about the matchup? I, I think that's the thing. People will say he's 3 0, but for me, like, I take like he trained with the good guys. You can be 3 0, but you've been in the gym for years. Train with Mark Hunt, uh, with a Tai Tu Vasa, with the guys that I, I look for, that I like. So I take him very serious. I think he's good. I think his game, he's, he got a solid striker. But I think I'm going to have the answer for everything he's going to bring to the table. I think in the contender series, you kind of had a chip on your shoulder, right? <laughs> I mean, you were the underdog. I wonder. Do you almost feel like that situation here? I mean, you're, you're you know, I you're, like you're the, not the hometown guy. I mean, are you I like to in? feel that way, yes. I like to feel that way. I like I like to go as an underdog and, and prove people wrong. And, and, and I'm pretty sure I'm going to be the underdog on this one. That's his hometown. He trained with the UFC guys. You don't know me. You don't know my gym. You don't know none about me. So I'm going to come and prove that. And I, I, I still have a lot of answers, a lot of questions to answer. I'm going to be, I'm going to let it go to UFC 243. What are the goals for you in this fight? I mean, obviously you want to win, everybody wants to win, but you know, the heavyweight division is a division where you can move up really quick. So, I mean, do you feel like you're going to make some kind of big statement and appear on the big scene, or is this just, let's go get a win and prove we belong here? I mean, what, what to you is the goal of this fight? I definitely want to prove that I belong in UFC. I'm 5-0, and a lot of people would think I'm green. You're 5-0, you're not know, at UFC level. But I'm also going to show my skills. Last time I didn't get to show all my striker. But this time I got a chance to, to give a three rounds of, of war, like a nice technical uh, brawl that I like. So I got a perfect opponent, biggest stadium, everybody's going to see it. I'm going to let it go. This is going to be good. You said three rounds, but I think a lot of people are thinking a couple big boys that can finish <laughs> fights. How do you, when, when you play this one out of your head, I mean, how do you think this goes? I'm expect three rounds, but I, I know he got power. I know I also I have power. I knock people out with my right hand. I have power in my kick. I'm going to be kicking a lot. I know I'm... This, he, we got to kick and punch. If one of us go down, it probably will be him. But I mean, I'll, I'll, I'm expecting three rounds of war.
right, that was the second half of the main event. Uh, main event. The main card opener. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Main the, event, main event. The main event is here, John Morgan. Make that mistake about event. it. Oh, you didn't even let me set you up. I'm trying to – I was going to give Is it, this a submission radio I, intro? I, I don't know gonna, if this is like a submission radio it, intro. It can't – you know what? I'll tell you what. I couldn't give a submission radio intro, so why don't you <laughs> now just we give didn't a even submission get intro. radio intro for yourself? Okay. Casper? You're the improv, man. you got to do it. you got to oh. do it. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to this podcast right now are two of the most tastiest, possibly spiciest boys on the scene. Of course, talking about Kasper Rosalowski, Dennis Skaratov. I thought you were talking about John and Ken. Uh -huh. Tasty, John. delicious, spicy Ken. boys. I thought that's where you were going. We've got two <laughs> words for you. Submission Radio in the house today. Good to be here, I boys. love it. I love it. It is Australian <laughs> MMA royalty. Dennis and Casper. Royalty yeah, by default. When you're the team. only two, it's easy to be royalty. <laughs> <laughs> wow, listen. I mean, you're out of the two that exist, you're at least in my top five. There's no question about it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. No worries. At least four and five. It's good to be in the conversation. <laughs> all right, well, listen. Let's talk about this card. We've been, we've been talking about it uh, all, all night long. We saved the best for last, of course. Um, listen, every, the, no, there's no making mistake about it. I mean, this is all about the main event. The main event is the, the fight that everybody cares about. And... I think what's made difficult about it, there's 22 fighters on the card, right? Seven are making their UFC <laughs> debut. I think that's the part that's most difficult for people to kind of wrap their head around and get excited about, right? Because sure. it's names you don't know. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I do feel, especially internationally, and, I, and to be honest, I think it's anywhere. Mm. I think when people buy a ticket to the UFC, what they want to see is the names they know, right? Not necessarily these fantastic right? Because the seven new talents – may prove to be absolutely phenomenal. They may prove to be future champions. And you can say, you were there, I saw them, I remember their debut. So, again, you do have to judge it after the event, mm. not before the event. But if we're talking about pre-event excitement, I do feel like a lot of it centers around being excited around names that you want to see. You know what else? I think also when the tickets are the price that they are, it's kind of like, well, what, what do you really get for that? You do get a great main event, but I think with that is expected, you know, a, a really stacked card from top to bottom. And I think there's like this misconception almost that like, yeah, Aussies just want to see other Aussies fight. It's like, well, yeah, if they're in yep. a big fight, yeah, like Hunt versus Verdum, you know, in Mexico for the belt or like Whitaker versus Romero, sure, we want those big fights. But like a lot of these guys, we've already seen them on the regional scene, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not even speaking for us. I'm speaking for a lot of the fans. This is what they're all saying. If you look at like the UFC's uh, Australian Facebook page and you see like, you know, this fight's announced, that fight's announced, it's just so much complaining. And I think a lot of it is kind of rightly so. We want the stars. We're not expecting necessarily, you know, Connor or... I don't know, like every single champ, but like give us someone who's like in title contention. Give us someone who, you know, fights that mean something. Yes, we have one amazing fight. Arguably, you know, maybe the best fight of the year, but, you know, what, what's happened to the rest of the card? I mean, John, as a friend of ours once said, you better believe that's a paddle. And it's not very impressive, basically. <laughs> I was like, uh-huh, uh-huh. And please continue to define that, sir. Okay, all right, but so no, look, you got two guys on there, Justin Taffer and Brad Riddell, and these two guys may end up arguably being guys that could get make it to a co-main event. Who knows, maybe a main event level. But the people in Australia want international talent, and I've been piping on about this for years, just like I was with this Jared Rochelle Stephens true fight at UFC uh, yeah. Y93 that made absolutely no sense, and people were confused what was going on when that thing happened. Whereas that uh, Cowboy Cerrone Justin Gaethje fight should have been on this card. These are two fighters that represent the Aussie public as to what they want to see. Guys that fight, guys with big name value, that would have had a lot of hype. Obviously, the Volkanovski Max Holloway fight, but what, like, was was there any chance that was going to really happen? I mean, that was pretty. Crazy. I mean, it was a, a one in a million. Apparently, that it was the UFC happen. actually hoped. They like, hoped, it, it, but what I heard behind the scenes is there was there was a, a glimmer. Of hope that it would happen, but realistically, Max Holloway couldn't turn around. When that, when that yeah, when that Frankie Edgar fight was booked, I think we all knew like the nail was in the coffin. Yeah. Like they would have to come out squeaky clean. It would have to be like you know a one minute knockout by Max Holloway, which is not what he's known for. And then you know even like fighters get so drained and tired from the training camps and beat up from that, and then the weight cut on top of that. I mean, it was almost impossible that he was going to make that turn. But I feel like even if the card remained almost exactly the same, if we had Volkanovski and Max Holloway on the card, it changes Different everything. Story. You've got two fights that you can sink your teeth into. And we were saying even before, like you could kind of make the argument that 234 before Rob fell out was kind of the better card because you had two big fights to hang your hat on, and here you kind of just have. So where, do you, so where do you stand in that? I mean, because, look, I, I think it's cool that it's another stadium show. Look, stadium shows don't happen that often. You know, mm. it, it's cool that it's happening. As you said, I mean, 
you said it, Casper, that maybe the fight of the year, right? Maybe the most anticipated fight of the year. So to get a fight that big, especially with two people with such strong ties to the region, you know, I mean, it's, it's an amazing fight. As they say, uh, the, perhaps the biggest combat sports fight in Oceania history, and I haven't heard a lot of people argue against that or say that that's silly braggadocio. So you know that it's that top heavy, it's that incredible, it's that amazing. But then, as you said, the rest of the card didn't necessarily shape out the way you wanted it to be. So overall, are you like, I'm so disgusted this is what the UFC offered us? Or are you like, ah, I'm still super stoked? I mean, if you had to come down on it, where, where do you guys stand from the local perspective? I think it's one of those things where, like, ever, ever since Mark Hunt's left the UFC, the UFC has struggled to fill that spot. And, like, as we know, and as a guy that he stick up down every single card, as a guy that was here for Verdum Tabura. How about that oh, yeah. for dedication? Who would around, miss that? Around Thanksgiving. Who would miss around that? People, well, you missed Thanksgiving almost because of that one. I mean, you, you are a dedicated man that knows his stuff, but Mark Hunt would come in and he would put on these fights where you'd be like, all right, like they might not have the biggest international talent on this card, but he is drawing these big heavyweight fights to the card. Imagine if Mark Hunt was on this card, like a UFC 193. Like he wasn't a big part of that, but he did fight Bigfoot Silver in that rematch, and that kind of added a bit of pizzazz. Pizzazz to that card, so that, they're in, a, in trouble now. Be yeah, because look, Tai Tuivasa, he, he he was supposed to be like their next Mark Hunt, right? Yeah. But they booked him too quickly. The JDS fight, he was winning and he made a mistake. You know, Blagoy, Blagoy is super tough. You know, that was a very yeah. very tough matchup. He is he's tough to fight because he doesn't look spectacular, but he makes you look, yeah. you know, yeah. not spectacular. And, and apparently, they wanted to do this uh, like Greg Hardy Tai Tuivasa fight. That didn't happen. And they were looked really wanting to do this Justin Willis fight. That didn't happen. I mean, and by the way, Justin Willis isn't a big name, but believe it or not, like the, the Aussies would have loved to see that guy get what's oh, coming to him here, you know, down here in Melbourne, oh. even though he probably could have maybe would have won it. But so it's, they're just shorthanded, and it, rather than bring talent in, and I mean, Holly Holm, I think they thought because she beat Ronda Rousey, that was going to rile people up. A lot but of the media would come and like chat to the yeah. girl, beat Holly Holm, uh, beat Ronda Rousey. She's in the rearview mirror, man. That yeah. was a big mistake. They made some mistakes booking this guy. I, I think like if you look at the names, a lot of them make perfect sense. Like Dan Hooker, right? He's a teammate of Israel Adesanya. He's from this region, city kickboxing. So you're like, yeah, it makes sense. It's just a shame that Dan... You know, uh, he has had some bad luck, you know, recently. He's on a great streak, and then, you know, he had that loss. Same thing with Tai Tuivasa. Like you mentioned, like, if he was on a bigger streak, if he won... Imagine if he beat Junior, and imagine if he beat Blagoy. Amazing. I know we're talking about hypotheticals. He would have a much more important fight. Same with, say, like a guy like Jake Matthews. You know, he lost in his last outing. Otherwise, he'd be on a good streak. And I feel like a lot of these fights, if they were almost exactly the same, maybe with higher opponents for the Aussies, they would just have that much more meaning and there will be that, sh that much more stakes. I think the names are good. I think it's just kind of you know shitty timing in a sense. Mm -hmm. fair, a fair enough. Card. Fair enough. Megan card. Anderson, same thing, right? All right, well, listen, that's what I want to get into. So we've talked about the main card. I want to bring you two boys uh, around for the local uh, angle for sure. Okay, bring now in, we, in, we're, we're talking about, let's, let's go to the previous. Because if anybody's listening to the MMA Roadshow, you know they're probably a little bit of a hardcore or my mom, you know, but I mean, they're probably, probably hardcore. Hey, Mama John. Yeah, thank you, exactly. Yeah. Now, listen, the names that you said there, you, Jake Matthews, Megan Anderson, those are the two names that kind of stand out, right, on the prelims, and I'm talking about the ESPN2 portion of the card. Mm. Um, let's talk about them in particular. Jake Matthews, Megan Anderson. Uh, Jake Matthews is a guy that's been around forever, right? At, at one point, I mean, he was tagged to be He was more popular the, than Robert Whittaker. Right? So he was the yeah. flag. He was going to be the flag bearer, right? Um, now he's kind of been relegated, I guess, to, to a prelim slot. Maybe yeah. hasn't necessarily fulfilled all the potential. Megan Anderson, somebody else who, man, came in with a lot of hype, uh, a, a lot of expectations. She hasn't necessarily met them. She's had some very revealing interviews uh, in the lead up to this, yeah. talking about mental health and what she's dealt all with. All and these guys. Man, man. so yeah. out of those two, because I think to most people, Jake Matthews and Megan Anderson on the prelims are going to be the names that stand out. Talking about whichever of those two you feel most you know, comfortable discussing, what these fights mean to each of them and, and what you're expecting in these matchups. Man, I don't know. Cause I think with Jake Matthews, like we mentioned that like at one point the UFC was really pushing him to be like bigger than Robert Whitaker. And by the way, like, People don't remember, we released, like, a flashback interview with Robert Whitaker in Adelaide and stuff. Like, mm. that back then, like, Jake Matthews was a much bigger na name than Robert Whitaker. You know, no How one crazy really is that? Cared. That was yeah. his first loss to James Vick. He got yeah, choked no out, really and Robert Whitaker knocked out Brad Tavares. That was kind of the turning he, point, it actually. Was, it was a big turning point. So, at the end of the day, like, we're really close with Jake's camp. Like, his dad will actually give me a call here and there just to see what's going on, and we'll catch up and stuff. Like, we go way back because we've been covering his fights for such a long time. We need these segments where like he'd have these bread rolls because he loves ah, bread yeah. and stuff when he cuts weight but 
at the end of the day, man, I think they need to make a choice. Like, if they if they win here on Sunday, are they going to pursue the bigger names and try and sort of climb the rankings? Because from what I understand, you know, the plan is to sort of fight in these Australian cards and maybe not fight the toughest challenges and sort of rack up as many wins as possible because of what Jake's been through. But at the same time, he's not going to move anywhere when it comes to fan perception or right. sort of popularity or anything like that. And he's not going to be like a young guy forever. So That's yeah. it, right? Because like, yeah. Jake was always – and I, I did always appreciate the fact that Jake said, listen, I don't want to leave here. I want to stay in Australia. I want to prove that you can accomplish things just being in Australia, which – Rob Whitaker ended up doing, yeah. you know, and he, he wanted Kevin to do that, Lee, right? Right. But and then the and other thing too, is went, he's always been the kid, yeah. right? But now he's what twenty five years old. He's not. He's he's not necessarily. I mean, that's still very very young yeah. in the career. But he's not the twenty year old kid anymore. Now it's time to step up to the plate a little bit. So I mean, do you feel like I don't say this is necessarily the make or break moment? Do you feel like he's in that? make or break stage of the career of whether are you really going to matter or not? It's funny, right, because he has sort of roots here. Like, he was going to school here. He's got his family here. He's, he's got a kid now as well. And I think he's got he's got his own gym. He definitely used to have. I'm assuming he's still got it. So I think things are, in a sense, pretty comfy here. He's got a good life here. And if you look at some of his... I, I, I don't know. And we've been asking this question pretty much since his debut. Are you going to move to a camp overseas? And he keeps shutting it down. So, And I, I'm not really getting inc any inklings that he, that's about to change. And if you look at his opponents, like he beat Akbar Ariola at UFC 193. Uh, had some trouble there. I believe he got head kicked and it was on wobbly legs. Johnny Case beat him. That was, was impressive. That, win, that yeah. was a fight that a lot of people were uh, counting him out for. Then he lost to Kevin Lee. Lost to Andrew Holbrook. Ended up moving up for uh, Boyan Velkovic, uh, Li Jing Lang. And Shinsu Anzai, and, and he was on a good streak in welterweight, but still Tough kind of names, fighting though. tough guys, but you know not really names. And then he fought Anthony Rocco Martin, or Rocco as he wants to be known Damn now. Right. Yeah, show and, some respect. And he's like he's a really good fighter, but he's not a huge name. So it's just like he he's he just keeps having these big stumbles. And I think now people are questioning, you know, what exactly is the ceiling for Jake Shields? And if he's not going to move over, you know, to the states. I, th I think that kind of spurs those questions even more. Yeah, let me just put it this way. Like, the guy that he's fighting on this card isn't a very, like, isn't the highest skilled fighter that he's fought before. So I think the right thing to do is you win this fight, and you get back on track, you get overseas, and you're fighting these guys, and you're climbing the ranks. But if his plan is to stick around in Australia and just fight these guys who ha don't have very impressive records because he doesn't want to lose very frequently and he thinks he's got all the time in the world. I think that's a big mistake. Yeah, listen, Mackie Patolo versus Callum Potter. Mackie Patolo making his debut. Callum Potter, of course, it didn't things didn't go so well in his debut. Yeah. He's going to look to turn things around. Uh, that could be a, a very difficult matchup, especially with Mackie as somebody who fights at middleweight from time to time, uh, moving down, and Callum is somebody that's moving up. I always get a little bit scared when those sort of things happen. But one I wanted to ask you guys about it because I had a chance to talk to, about, uh, to, to both these kids this week. Mm -hmm. Jamie Malarkey versus Brad Riddell, kind of a, 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 a matchup of, of locals, a matchup that was thrown together on relatively short notice. Uh, Brad Riddell is uh, out of that City Kickboxing Academy, right, so he's hoping to get things started for, for the crew that night. Um, two polar opposites in terms of personality. I think two polar opposites in terms of um, their backgrounds. Uh, as, as a battle of two locals, uh, give, give us some insight on this one. Yeah, I, I find this really interesting because, you know, like Israel Adesanya took his time to get to the UFC. He could have probably been there a lot earlier, but Eugene Behrman made sure that he had all the proper skills before he got into the UFC. I feel like Brad Rudell's in that kind of position as well now. Yeah. In regards to the guy's uh, uh, skills as a kickboxer, I mean, this is a guy, like Muay Thai and everything like that, this is a guy that fought John Wayne Parr twice, and he beat him the second time That's under incredible. the toolage That's of incredible. Eugene Behrman. The first time was apparently like short notice, and he didn't get a chance to put a game plan together. This is a guy that could have been in the UFC very, very quickly. But I believe Eugene's probably like, hey, like, let's make sure you've got everything important that you need in your game before you fight. And he spoke to us about this, about the fact that, like, people make a mistake coming to the UFC and thinking they're going to improve while they're, they're, they're in the UFC. He believes he has the, all the skill sets to come into the UFC now and make a run for it, which is what the city kickboxing guys kind of do. Mm -hmm. You kind of get a sense from them that there is no gap left unopened. They're ready to go when they come in. So this guy is going to be extremely exciting. And, you know, Malaki, he sees this as an opportunity to come in here and make a name for himself of Brad. And the thing with him is, he, you know, he called him out. He's been talking a bit of trash. He's actually like a wily veteran who's been in the sport. Mm. And that makes him inc incredibly dangerous. Like, think about it from his perspective. This is kind of like his rocky moment. This is his one chance in front of a stadium in Melbourne, a guy that's been forgotten about by the local scene by many, many people. 
beaten a couple of times where really had that streak and was supposed to make it in and was supposed to be like that Brad Rudell. This is his chance to take Brad's sort of hype and move forward. And with Brad, he's got to fight a guy that people aren't expecting much from. So the pressure is on because they want him to go in there and just flatline a guy like Malarkey. And, you know, that's, that's the hardest thing to do, I think. Both, both, you know, people in Australia have such high expectations for Malarkey and people in NZ have high expectations for uh, Brad Rudell. And uh, some more insight on him. He's obviously the striking coach there at Seed Kickboxing. He's Volkanovski's striking coach. So that says a lot. Volkanovski actually beat Jamie Malarkey a while ago and Malarkey called out Brad Rudell. And Volkanovski is no stranger to getting called outs and we all see how that sort of ended. So this is a fascinating fight. I dig it. All right, listen, the early prelims. I want to uh, t tip a little hand. Bruno Silva versus Khalid Taha. I think probably uh, this is definitely flying under people's radar, but I, I'm impressed. Bruno Silva is actually Henry Cejudo's protege. Henry Cejudo is here not as a guest fighter. No, he's actually here to help corner Bruno Silva. Um, this is a guy that he's helped kind of bring up through the ranks. My understanding is uh, he basically got Bruno Silva signed to the UFC as a personal favor from Dana White for doing the Ultimate Fighter as a wow. coach. He said, listen, man, you owe me a favor. Get my guy Bruno Silva in the UFC now. Bruno is a natural flyweight. He's going to be fighting at bantamweight. He wants to fight at flyweight, but uh, you got to take what you can get. And it does seem like the flyweight division is restocking, so we'll see. So that's a name to watch out for that, that, that you might not know uh, that, that you maybe should. And then meanwhile, Khalid Taha, who's on, on the other side, is uh, a, a devastating guy at bantamweight. He has incredible power. Uh, and that's the first fight of the night, and that leads into another local, Nadi Kasim versus uh, yes. Ji-Yon Kim. I want to ask you about this as well. Nadi Kasim. I'm curious kind of what you guys think of her and evaluate her. I mean, that, that team kind of kind of came in, made a little splash, and then has not necessarily gotten the results that they wanted. Um, but, you know, sometimes in the women's division it's not quite as stocked, it's not quite as full uh, as everything else. I mean, is this kind of a, a make-or-break moment? Because there's things about Nadia Kassim. I mean, she's got a little bit of a gangster vibe. I think, yeah. you know, there's well, there's some things that are very market. 187. There's things about her that I think are very marketable. Uh, but she, she's got to pick up a win, and this is not exactly an easy assignment that she's been given here. What, what do you think about the, the importance of this fight and kind of her future viability? I, I think the interesting thing about Nadia is, like, we have a bit of a – not a relationship with her, but a videographer, Christian. He's, like, pretty much a, a, a foster part of her family, invited up for cake, invited up for special occasions. And Knows her mum personally. Calls her Misha Tate. Adorable <laughs> face of our videographer. <laughs> Hey, Christian. But the thing with Nadia is I think the UFC has had a lot of hope in her. I mean, she's got that image of a per like a, a female Nate Diaz who goes out there, doesn't right. take any shit, 187. She was in that um, embedded where she was telling Suman he was a fat cunt or whatever because he was eating in front of her. So the Reminder, it's okay to say that in this part of the world. Just anybody that's offended right it's now. It's PG oh, yeah. right now in Melbourne. I don't know what's going on in America, but it's PG here. So the fact of the matter is I think this is a very young person. While you speak about mental health, she str she really struggled with mental health. She spoke to us about that. I'm sure she spoke to you guys about that. A big theme, by the way, through the card, all the way from the top to the very bottom is these athletes struggling with it. But she came to the UFC, what, when she was like 21? Yeah. Now she's 23. She came from practically a, a camp with, you know, uh, friends of hers, these trainers who are also sort of like her family and friends. Her brother's a part of it. So it's hard to be prepared for something like that. We spoke to her about her UFC journey. It didn't end up the way she, she was hoping, but... Coming in here, she looks very collected, very happy. Her mental health seems to be on point. She's been doing some strength and conditioning. So how yeah. about that? And I think she's got a bunch of strategies coming in there. I think before when she came in, she wanted to put on a big show and impress everyone. But I think with this one, there's going to be a bit of a GSP Nadia coming in. Nah. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Like, she spoke to us about how, you know, it, it was the mental issues that were kind of holding her back. You know when you hear fighters say, like, I, you know, what you saw in the cage is not the way that I am in the gym. I think it's kind of the case for a lot of these guys, but I think when that happens, it's smart for her to take the time off that she did because, you know, mental illness is not something that is uh, is fixed or cured over overnight. And so you look at a guy like, say, Phil DeFries, who had, like, you know, bad mental issues, and then he, he's doing so well in KSW at the moment. And so I think her taking that time kind of helps. You mentioned the, the, the strength and conditioning. Like, I saw she's obviously, like cutting weight now so she's a lot smaller and slimmer but I saw some of the photos that Christian took when she was kind of like almost bulking in a sense she looked like a completely different person there was so much more muscle on her especially around like the legs and the glutes and stuff like you can tell she's she knows exactly what she's doing so I don't know I'm, I'm, I'm expecting a sort of evolved version also don't forget like Dennis mentioned she's very young and when fighters are that young you know they, they have they the, can make big evolutions they can make these big, big yeah. leaps pretty quickly yeah. yeah and Christian had a crazy photo shoot with her Christian what's your Instagram again <laughs> at Christian 
At Christian what? Editor. Editor. At Christian Editor. Check out the special photo shoot that they had. Unbelievable. Look at these personal plugs just slipping in. We'll edit that out. Don't worry about that. Uh, Brought to you okay. by Masashi. <laughs> Brought to you by Masashi. <laughs> all right, listen. Hey, guys, I appreciate your help bringing all, all those prelims, but I couldn't have uh, MMA royalty on here like yourselves for the region. Let me circle back to the main event just real quickly as we wrap up. Uh, I, I, of course, you guys are impartial in terms of who wins and that sort of thing. I mean, we're all just covering the event, but you guys live here. You know, you guys, you know, you want to see the sport grow. You want to see things flourish because as the sport grows and flourishes, so do you and so do your opportunities. What is the best case scenario for mixed martial arts in the Anzac region on Sunday morning? Is it one particular victor? Is it one particular style of fight? What, what would be the proper result to help continue the sport expand and grow? in this region. Just for me, it's easy since they're out of the you're winning, right, Cass? I mean, no doubt about it, we spoke to him about the fact that he wants to fight John Jones at Raiders Stadium and Stipe Miocic over in a stadium in New Zealand, and I have nothing against Robert Whitaker because the guy's an absolute beast, and I love the fact that he's doing a speaking tour. I love the fact they're shooting a documentary about his life. I love the fact that he does Grange TV and he's led us into his life and has uh, inspired people by talking about his mental health issues. But this, but Israel Adesanya is a bona fide star, and if you see what what's happening this week compared to what happened when he fought Anderson Silva, I feel like he's got way more fans in Melbourne than he used mm. to. I mean, this is a guy that's getting mobbed on the street. This is a guy that's absolutely, for the first time, I feel like enjoying the fact that he is becoming much bigger than what he was before. Mm. You know, it's interesting. Like I think with Rob, you guys have heard of tall poppy syndrome, have you? It's a thing in Australia, right? Like, obviously, the first immigrants in Australia were prisoners. And so, as a prisoner, like, you can't elevate yourself. What do you do, right? You can't get a job, house, nothing. So, you have to bring everybody down. And I, I have to say, that's kind of a part of Australian culture, right? Which is why a lot of our athletes are super low-key. You won't see Australian athletes saying, like, I'm the best, I'm the greatest, because everyone will tear them down. And say, you know you what, know, man? I've heard that phrase before, but I didn't know that the, that was the origin yeah, of that's, it. That's what it means. That's why, like, you look at Rob, like, and even some... Because like, Israel it, throws it out there, too. He's mentioned it a couple times. But Israel's and from New Zealand. And, right. and yet, New, like, Kiwis are super laid back, but I feel like tall poppy syndrome is not as prevalent over there. Yeah. That's why, like, you see Rob and Jake Matthews and all these guys, like, if you say to them, like, you're the best, they won't take that compliment. They'll be like, oh, I'm all right. Because it's, it's almost a fear of, like, I don't want to say I'm the best because people will shit on me. And I feel like Israel is kind of more towards like hip hop culture and he, like U.S. culture. He's he's you know very brash. He's got the bravado. He says things that are very reminiscent of Drake. So I think like for the U.S. market, Israel sells a lot better. I think for the Aussie market, Rob is a lot more relatable. And I, I'm sometimes shocked by some of the like numbers and the metrics that Rob's able to draw. I, I don't think it's as clear cut like with this event that like Israel sold this out. Yes, he did the marketing, but like. When we, when we do Israel interviews, like, we've got a big Aussie fan base. Some of the comments are brutal. A lot of them are like, oh, we want to see this guy get knocked out, etc. And, yeah, like, as media members, some, sometimes we'll say, like, look, Rob just doesn't say a ton of stuff that are, like, headline grabbing. But Aussies just love Rob. They love that attitude. Insane. And, and so I, th I think, in a way, for this region, I think Rob is is the more relatable guy, but I think Israel will get the bigger fights. And so in that sense, it'll get more people talking. And like like, like, like you mentioned, beat up and stuff. I was going to say, Jones, I, think, yeah. I, think, I think with Rob, I think one thing I think I took out of this week more than ever before is that A, he is getting more comfortable speaking to me, but you yeah. have to kind of mind what he says for the moment. It's like, for instance, uh, in, in the interview that we played earlier, I love just a little segment where I was like, hey, is this getting personal? He said, if it had gotten personal, oh, I'd have handled it personally. And I love that. And then earlier today, uh, I, I was talking to him about, you know, hey, can, you know, you know, how do you want to, how do you want this fight to end? He's like, look, I'm not looking to finish it. I'm looking to drag him into the trenches and see if he wants out early. And mm. that's like, that's that to me, that's strong trash talk, but in oh, a very yeah. subtle way. You know, it's like, hey, I'm not trying to finish him, but I'm going to make it dirty, and if he wants out, just tap. You that, know what I mean? That's kind of like GSP. Like, that's really like demeaning. Remember when GSP told Josh Koscheck like. I'm going to win the fight, and this is his second chance, and after I win the fight, he's not going to know what to do, and he's going to have to make some serious career choices. <laughs> yeah, Jesus <that's> Christ. <laughs> like, that's deep. You know what I mean? He's basically saying you know, he was going to have to talk about another career path kind of thing. And it's not like he's calling – it's not like when Colby Covington trash talks and, you know, he makes it really personal. That's just like, oh, God, that gets in the feels. And I think you're right about, like, Rob saying that. But um, I don't know. Just be, Imagine if, like – I just think Israel is so savvy when it comes to the media. Like, you could have a, an interview that maybe not much is happening, and he'll throw you a line 
because I think he's aware, like, up, oh, got to get something out there. Like, I'll throw these guys something. You know, talking about Stipe Mircic, talking about uh, you know, John Jones, saying how I might skip light heavyweight and go straight up to heavyweight. Whether it happens or not, it almost doesn't matter, but it gets people talking, going, wow, look at this guy and his, his you know, warrior mentality. You stir the pot. This guy has balls, right? You stir the pot. That's yeah. what's up. All right, guys, listen, pleasure as always. Normally, uh, you guys are kind enough to have me on your show, so I'm happy that I was here in your neck of the woods. And you Dude, what, what, what an honor, right? You, you say we're MMA royalty. We're definitely not. We're like the, we're like the clowns of uh, Aussie MMA, but this is a true honor to, to be on this show uh, with you guys. Much respect, much respect. That means a lot. Well, then the honor should continue over Frosty Beverages. Uh, yeah. Yes. Let's, uh, let's continue our conversations off air. We'll have a few more drinks. We'll uh, hang out with all these wonderful people that are here with us. This, this evening and for everybody else we'll just say thanks for listening